Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Ainsworth Morgan. I am the acting chair of the Toronto Police Services Board, and I would like to welcome you all to the hybrid meeting of the board. We will start with our land acknowledgement. Although this meeting is taking place virtually, we acknowledge that the land we are on as we hold this meeting on traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The board also acknowledges that the Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 and signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the William Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas of Chippewa bands. I will now turn it over to the board's executive director, Chief of Staff, Ryan Teshner, We'll go over the meeting's logistics. Brian. Thank you, Mr. Morgan, and thank you to everyone who's joined us in person, as well as those who have called into this meeting. Please note that this meeting is also being live streamed, as always, on the Toronto Police Service YouTube channel, and will be available there at the conclusion of this meeting. Joining us in person, we have Acting Chair Ainsworth Morgan, Vice Chair Francis Nunziata, Member Lisa Kostakis, Member Ann Morgan, Councillor Vincent, Vincent Crisanti, and Councillor Lily Chang. We also have members of our board office staff. Chief Raymer has extended his regret for being unable to be here for what would have been his last board meeting, which I know he was looking forward to attending. He's advised that he will be at headquarters for the change of command ceremony on Monday, so he may personally transfer command of the Toronto Police Service to Chief Designate Myron Demke. I do welcome other members of Chief Raymer's command team, including Acting Chief Lauren Pogue, members of the service, and of course, members of the public. We have individuals who have registered to make deputations both in person as well as virtually on, our, on some of our agenda items. As per our regular meeting process, deputations will be heard prior to the item being discussed and voted on by board members. When it comes time to do a deputation, those who have registered will be called upon or brought into the meeting by our colleague, Duby Cannon Gisser. As always, deputants will speak, followed by an opportunity for board members to ask them questions. And before we go further today, Chair, given that it's a new term of council and we have some new board members who have joined us, I'd like to move ahead with the swearing in of our new board members. We'll begin with Councillor Nunziata. Do you want to take the Bible? Yes. And if you'll repeat after me. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties and that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties. As a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. As member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Faithfully, faithfully impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Any other act and any, any regulation, rule, or bylaw. Any other act and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. So help me God. So help me God. And now the oath of secrecy. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. So help me God. So help me God.
address. Thank you. Oh, did I keep the pen? <laughs> Councillor Chang. <laughs> you okay? Sure. First, your oath of office. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties. As a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. As a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. <laughs> Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Any other act and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. Any other act and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. So help me God. So help me God. And now the oath of secrecy. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. In the course of my duties as in a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. So help me God. So help me God. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Souvenir. Oh, <laughs> can I get the pen package? Will you take my photo? Yeah, oh, she didn't hear me. Oh, she's not. Yeah, Daniel. Okay. No, I'm getting the one. That's fine. Mm. Okay, that's good. We'll fix that. Councillor Crisanti, the oath of office. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. I solemnly swear that I will be loyal to His Majesty the King and to Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties. And that I will, to the best of my ability, discharge my duties. As a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. As a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Faithfully, impartially, and according to the Police Services Act. Any other act and any regulation, rule, or bylaw. Any other act or any regulation, rule, or bylaw. So help me God. So help me God. And now the oath of secrecy. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. I solemnly swear that I will not disclose any information obtained by me. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. In the course of my duties as a member of the Toronto Police Services Board. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. Except as I may be authorized or required by law. So help me God. So help me God. One more? Oh, okay. sorry. You want to hold that? Here, I'll hold that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I get to keep the souvenir. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Back to you. Thank you, Ryan. And I would like to uh, make sure we can, uh, any declaration of conflict of interest uh, according to the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, any 
declaration of conflict of interest. Seeing none. Okay, we'd like to proceed. I first like to uh, like to have a motion to add item 13 to the public agenda. Ms. Kazakis, I have a seconder. Ms. Nusniata, uh, carried. Okay, so the item is added. We do have a deputation on this item. So if we can have Doobie, Mr. Langefeld. Is he? Good morning, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair, or Mr. Morgan, I guess, at this point. <laughs> um, I, I, um, uh, most of the, if not all of the board will be aware that uh, because of Toronto's municipal code, uh, section 27-6.4, subsection H, Councillor Nunziata is ineligible for the position of board chair by virtue of the fact that she holds the office of Speaker of Toronto City Council. Um, Toronto Municipal Code, Charter, uh, Chapter 27, Municipal Procedures, uh, Section 27-6.4, reads Council Chair, subsection H, Speaker not to chair standing committee certain agencies. The Speaker cannot serve as a Standing Committee Chair, Community Council Chair, or as the Chair of the Toronto Transit Commission or the Police Services Board. And meanwhile, uh, TPS Procedural Bylaw Section 7.2 begins by stating 7.2, the position of ch if the position of Chair becomes vacant, the Vice Chair, if willing, will act in his or her place and assume the position of Chair for the remainder of the term until an election is held at the first meeting in the calendar year. And so it's my submission that, uh, therefore, in addition to being legally precluded from holding the position of TPS chair, that Councillor Speaker Nunziata is uh, present, prevented also by the same legal restriction from fulfilling the sole obligation of vice chair, which is to act as chair in the chair's absence. And therefore, that, that would preclude her from being appointed as vice chair. Uh, I expect that this would probably have been raised by others here today if I'd forgone reading this, but uh, if I didn't mention it now, the reality is that the board's rules would uh, prevent me from raising it later if it, if it uh, wasn't brought up for others, by others. So I apologize for uh, making comments that are likely a waste of time here. Um, I certainly support the board acting in the same vein as it did in November to appoint Ainsworth Morgan here today as interim chair for the remaining two weeks of 2022. I note the Police Services Act requirement that another election to name a chair and vice chair for the 2023 year must be conducted at the first meeting of each year. Um, that um, I also raise that given both that Councillors Chung and Christiani, uh, sorry, Crescenti are uh, brand new to the board, uh, I would suggest that it would be inappropriate for either of them to act as chair, and therefore the logical choices are either Ms. Morgan or Ms. Gustakis, both of whom seem equally competent and able to fill the role, and the determining factor will likely be uh, a particular interest or aversion to actually doing so. Um, but this brings up a, uh, an associated issue here, which is... Um, relates to uh, communications with the board and its members. And this came up in dealing with this matter earlier. Um, the board members will be aware that the board has its main board at tpsb.ca email address. Uh, and this creates a uh, uh, some challenge surrounding the most, most fundamental issue, what or who is the police board? And section 27 of the Police Services Act is crystal clear on this. 27.1 or subsection 1, there shall be a police services board for every municipality that maintains a police force. And in the case of Toronto, of Toronto, subsection 9 provides that seven member boards in certain circumstances. Section 27 sub 9, where the lieutenant governor and council has approved, the board shall consist of a the head of municipal council or another member of council appointed by resolution of the council, B, two members of council appointed by resolution, C, one person appointed by resolution of council who is neither a member of the council nor a an employee of the municipality, 
and D, three persons appointed by the, the lieutenant governor in council. And what this definitely makes abundantly clear is the reality that the board is not, like the corporation of the city of Toronto, some corporate entity that persists indefinitely of its own accord with random folks assigned to manage it. Rather, the police services board specifically prescribed, or the police services act specifically prescribes that the board consists of, in Toronto's case, seven appointed members, soon to be nine members when that 2019 law takes effect. You're naturally able to hire staff, janitors, typists, receptionists, up to analysts, administrators, and executive directors to have them take care of the mundane tasks on your behalf. But those people are not the board. They are rather people that work for the board, just as the chief and the officers in the service are. So emails to the board are, in fact, emails to the seven members. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the time. Um, yeah, I, I, w I would just suggest that the members should all have email addresses was my the long version or the short version. Thank you. Thank Chair, you. Uh, we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions of the deputant? No. Seeing none, thank you. Mr. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Morgan. Uh, just before I begin, um, I, I can't help but notice that Mr. Lagenfeld used the word mundane to describe the work uh, that our team does, so I'm going to have to just respectfully disagree. At its meeting on November 14th, 2022, the board recognized then Vice Chair Councillor Francis Nanzietta as chair following former Chair Jim Hart's retiring as a member and as chair of the board. Subsequent to that board meeting, City Council elected Councillor Nanzietta as Speaker of Council on November 23rd, 2022. As City of Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 27, titled Council Procedures, states that the Speaker cannot serve as Chair of the Police Services Board. Vice Chair Member Ainsworth Morgan has been acting in the position of Chair in accordance with Section 7 of the Board's Procedural Bylaw. Given these unique circumstances, however, Mr. Morgan has advised that he will step down from the role of chair, and Ms. Uh, Councillor Nanziata has advised that she will step down from the role as vice chair so that the board today can formally elect an interim chair and a vice chair to serve in those roles until an election is held at the board's first meeting in 2023. These elections will be held in accordance with the procedures set out in section five of the procedural bylaw. And so now I'd like to turn it over to the board administrator, Ms. Akeem, to conduct the election. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. In accordance with the board's procedural bylaw, we will now hold an election for the position of chair and vice chair. Nominations for the position of chair will now be accepted. May I have a nomination? Councillor Nunziata. Yes, I would like to nominate Ainsworth Morgan. Thank as you. Chair, as acting chair. Thank you. Councillor Francis Nunziata nominates uh, board member Ainsworth Morgan. May I have a seconder? I'll second. Thank you very much, Ms. Kostakis. Are there any further nominations? No. Hearing none, nominations for the position of chair are now closed. Councillor Nunziata nominated Mr. Morgan, uh, which was seconded by board member Lisa Kostakis. Mr. Morgan, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you. The nomination carries anonymously. Thank you. There being only one nomination for the position of chair, Mr. Morgan is elected as the interim chair of the board. Congratulations, Chair Morgan. And now I would like the board to um, hold an election for the position of vice chair. Nominations for the position of vice chair will now be accepted. May I have a nomination, please? I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Francis Nuziano for Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair Morgan. 
Chair Morgan uh, nominates Councillor Nunziata. Can I have a sec second? Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Are there any further nominations? No? Thank you. Hearing none, nominations for the position of Vice Chair will now be closed. Chair Morgan nominated Councillor Nunziata, which was seconded by Board Member Ann Morgan. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none, the nomination carries anonymously. Vice Chair Nunziata, do you accept the nomination? Yes, thank you. Thank you. There being only one nomination for the position of Vice Chair, Councillor Francis Nunziata has been elected for the position of Vice Chair of the Board. Congratulations, Vice Chair Nunziata. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Al. So I've been advised that uh, we have a motion that we need to put before the board to ratify decisions that were made before November 18th and today. Motion up there, Duke. Sorry, I'll move, move it, Mr. Chair. Seconder, Ms. Moore. Ms. Kasakis, okay. Any opposed? Okay. Passed. All in favor? Thank you. Carried. Before we be begin today's meeting, uh, it is an honor for me to speak today as we pay tribute to Chief James Raymer, who is retiring next Monday, December 19th, after a long and esteemed career as a dedicated, inspiring, exceptional police leader. Chief Raymer joined the Toronto Police Service in 1980 and was held, has held a variety of positions within the organization throughout his career. Chief Raymer has a long history of community engagement, which has included leading the services community partnerships and engagement unit, formerly the community mobilization unit, and co-chairing the Chief's Black Consultative Committee for five years. Chief Raymer has also overseen the expansion of initiatives to respond to persons in crisis, including mental health crisis, more effectively and compassionately. In addition, Chief Raymer continuously acted as a champion of promoting diversity and inclusivity within all ranks of the service, working to ensure that the frontline and senior ranks of the service truly reflected the communities we serve. A noted leader in, policing, in the policing community, Chief Raymer also led the development of a gang prevention strategy, which focuses on proactive engagement with young people who may be in conflict with the law and includes community outreach and engagement with partners in communities most impacted by crime. He's also a member of many national and international law enforcement bodies with particular expertise in counterterrorism, national security, and organized crime. In 2010, Chief Raymer was awarded the 30-year Police Exemplary Service Medal. He has since received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012, and in 2019, he was uh, invested as the member of the Order of Merit of the Police Forces by the Governor General of Canada. Prior to his role as chief, he held positions of deputy chief of Specialized Operations Command, which is comprised of the service's various investigative squads within the detective uh, operations and a variety of specialized uniform units with specific uh, safety operations. As chief, he steered the continued support of Vision Zero to make our roads safer, focus on preventing hate crimes and increasing investigative capacity expanded the neighborhood community officers program, supported community poli uh, policing in 
in our most vulnerable communities and strengthen relationships with communities through comprehensive police reform and the recommended from the, the missing and missed review. Chief Framer has led our organization through a period of unprecedented trial and change marked by extraordinary and significant challenges, opportunities, as well as progress. During his term, Chief Framer has not only navigated the organization with tremendous grace, diplomacy, and insight, but he has also demonstrated a sincere and con concrete commitment to ensuring of accountability, transparency, and policing reform. His work has been meaningful, dependent on the services relationships with many communities it serves. The board is extremely grateful for you, Chief Raymer, for your stabilizing the impressive leadership and your willingness to extend your term to allow for an effective transition period to support continued progress on the boards and services community safety priorities. To me, this is a true testament to your clear commitment to this organization and indeed to this city. On behalf of the board, I'd like to sincerely thank you for your incredible contributions to increasing, to policing over, the, over your career and for your inspiring balance and compassionate leadership. You have consistently and effectively championed your members internally while also always working collaboratively with the board and other stakeholders to ensure that policing services are delivered in the city professionally, equitably, and with compassion. You are a respected leader, not only among women and men of this organization, but among your peers as a noted executive police, uh, police leader. Throughout your career, you have demonstrated exceptional law enforcement leadership balanced by a track record of working with communities to foster meaningful partnerships and effective, sustained mobilization. You have made the city immeasurably better, kinder, and safer. We wish you all the best in your richly earned retirement. I'd like to uh, take this meeting over to the board members if you have any comments to add. Council Nunziato. Thank you very much. And it's unfortunate that uh, Chief Raymer can't be here with this last board meeting. I know he was looking forward to it when I spoke to him. Um, so I, um, I want to thank Chief Raymer um, for his years uh, for, uh, with the Toronto Police Services. But in particular, uh, as Chief, um, Chief Raymer attended a number of community meetings in my ward where he was very well received and he engaged with the community. And I know that uh, I speak on behalf of all my constituents who were very happy that he was able to come out to these meetings and address them on safety issues. I also want to thank Chief Raymer for expanding the Neighbourhood Officers Program, which was very uh, supportive um, in, uh, in my ward and I'm sure citywide as well. Um, the, uh, one of the meetings that the chief did attend a few years ago um, in the Falstaff community where uh, residents were complaining about the number of gun violence and at that meeting he pointed out to the uh, community that he would promise to get security cameras on Falstaff um, which everyone was very excited about because uh, I think it would make a big difference and we're looking forward to it. And we did get those security cameras. And so he's, he's a man of his word. And I, I know I speak on behalf of my constituents in York Southwest and, and the whole city of Toronto. Thank you very much, Chief Raymer, um, and your engagement in the Police Services Board as well, uh, working with us. And um, looking forward to seeing you on Monday. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Crescenti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, so I, I'm a new member here, but uh, I know Chief Raymer, and, and um, uh, you know, I, I also want to take the opportunity to thank him not only for his service, but to thank him for the, for the great work that he's done within the service and within um, uh, the City of Toronto, all communities. Uh, he leaves a legacy of, of respect. People respect him. He's um, uh, and people respect him on the ground. There, there's people I come across in, in my old community all the time that tell me that the 
the chief has done a, a great job of strengthening relationships in, in these communities. Uh, the, uh, you know, just the mere fact that he's grown the, uh, the, um, uh, the community officer program uh, is in itself, you know, a great thing. And I know that he's, he's committed to seeing that program continue to grow and to continue to build relationships. Uh, he's going to be missed. I wish him all the best uh, on behalf of my community on, uh, and also on behalf of my family. Uh, and I wish him well in uh, the next stage of his life. And I look forward to seeing him on Monday as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor okay. Crisanti. Member Ann Morgan. Um, it's hard to summarize um, everything I want to say about Jim. Uh, in a couple of minutes, but um, I met Jim in 1995. He was the officer in charge on a murder investigation, and it became apparently apparent to me very early on that um, he had some of the best qualities that I admire in both a police officer but also in a human being, which included his loyalty, his impeccable um, duty to the public, and his judgment. And um, we'd often sit down, uh, you know, when we we're brainstorming problems that arose um, over the years as I got to know him both in a management role and in as a prosecutor role, and always boiled down to doing the right thing, which is not always easy to do when you have bosses that you report up to and people that you try to please below you. He was always a, a tower of strength and integrity. And he always um, made me proud to do what I do because I tried to emulate him and his sort of values of seeking um, community safety, but even more importantly, access to justice for especially disadvantaged uh, individuals in our city. Um, I admired him mostly as, as acting chief because you can come into an acting position and take the view, do no harm, and basically coast. But he did not do that because he's so loyal and so capable and so duty bound and entrenched that he decided he was gonna point the ship in the right direction and during his term fulfilled many of the things that in the past were but difficult um, challenges and um, got the ball rolling, including the 81 recommendations and uh, more further the um, missing a missed inquiry. Um, Jim uh, is, is more than just a colleague to me and a mentor. Uh, he's my friend and uh, it's an honor and privilege uh, to known Jim in his capacity as a police officer, but I cherish that he is still um, someone I can call a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Member Morgan. Ms. Kostakis. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'd like to echo everything that everyone was saying as well. Um, but I think what stands out with the chief, like everyone has stated as well, is not just the position that he held, but the human being behind that position makes a big difference in, in such a position that is that is always that is admired but also criticized and and knocked down every so often in in, in this climate right now as well and um he was never shy of of taking responsibility no one is perfect in the world um and as people point out our service as well and and hence why there's recommendations and us moving forward into addressing all of that and and he did that with accountability with respect and with dignity and with an ethic behind it and this isn't a recognition comment i think it's more about a respect and showing respect for an individual who also uh, personifies respect and dignity and i've been in the sector in the nonprofit sector and social services for 35 years in every area of of the city and i think a big step in people's perception our community members in the respect for the police and the work that they do is really um, the crucial work that the interim chief has been doing and, and really is seen as a chief. It's rare that people use the word interim chief 
and the way he has uh, not handled or managed the service members or the community, but how he responded. So all the best. Um, I'm sure we'll still all be in touch and, and hopefully he'll uh, sustain and be engaged with our service to help us uh, in moving forward. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your service in your years and all the best to uh, you and your family. Thank you, Ms. Kasakis. Any other? I think we do have a special guest here that would like to also share some thoughts uh, regarding Chief Raymer's uh, retirement. Do we, if we can add former chair uh, Jim Hart to uh, say a few words. Just bear with us one second. Okay, Sherry. Apologies, everybody. We'll we'll have this cleared up in a second. We're gonna put you on my speaker. Mr. Hurt, are you there? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Go ahead. We're just uh, a little old school right now, but uh, we can definitely hear you. Uh, sorry, some technical issues from uh, downtown Brighton here. Am I good to go, Chair Morgan? Go ahead. Yes, clear. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank Chair Morgan and the board for giving me the opportunity to say a few words at this last board meeting before Chief Raymer's retirement from the Toronto Police Service. Chief Raymer, a few months ago, September 2022, the CBC wrote an article entitled What's Behind the Recruitment Process for the New Police Chief? They wanted to know why the hiring process was taking two years. My simple answer was, we, put it, we would have put it out much sooner if Chief Raymer didn't do such a fantastic job, quite frankly. I could have said much more because you are truly a great leader. You led the Toronto Police Service through a challenging period in policing and you did it exceptionally well because you know how to speak truth to power and you inspire those around you to be the best that they can be. Great leaders are measured in many ways, but one important way is who they surround themselves with in the workplace. Chief, you surround yourself with a top-notch command 
and your chief's office itself as individuals who are not only excellent in what they do, but who are terrific people as well. You are leaving this organization stronger and in very capable hands. I know that being the chief of police of the Toronto Police Service was the crowning achievement of your career. But having gotten to know you quite well over the last couple of years, I know that the crowning achievement of your life is being a proud grandpa, a father, a husband, and a son. It was an honor to meet your father at the Chiefs Gala a month ago. When I asked him, what does it feel like to be the father of the best police chief the city has ever had? The look on his face said it all. You have one very proud dad, Chief. Chief, when command changes on Monday, your four-decade career comes to a close and you start your next journey. Know that you have made a deep and lasting impact on not only policing in Toronto, but in Ontario and in Canada. They'll be felt for generations to come. I look forward to seeing you on Monday, Chief. Thank you, everyone. I hope you heard that. We did. Thank you, former Chair. I'd just like to now turn it over to Mr. Teschner to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to speak today as we all honor Chief James Raymer for his extraordinary policing career and his stellar leadership as Chief of the Toronto Police Service. Over his term, Chief Raymer has worked closely with the board in charting a course for wide-ranging changes to be made across the organization achieving progress in implementing comprehensive police reform in collaboration with the City of Toronto and other community stakeholders. He has skillfully balanced the importance of recognizing excellence in our people and expressing gratitude to service members for the important work that they do each and every day with a clear commitment to addressing important issues in policing today, including confronting anti-black racism, systemic discrimination, building accountability, increasing transparency, and engaging in reform. Chief Raymer, on a personal note, it has been a distinct pleasure and privilege to work with you over the past several years. Your sincere and obvious dedication to, the, to integrating meaningful civilian governance and oversight of the police into the way this organization operates has been noted nationally and internationally and has been appreciated both by our board and by the many members of the community who have expressed confidence in your leadership. My work for the last long while has centered on good governance and oversight, particularly in policing. Many experts in the field will often speak about the governors, board members, professional staff, as the necessary pieces to create good governance in policing. But they often forget about the chiefs. Through my work with you, Chief Raymer, day in and day out during your tenure, it has become clear to me just how important, how essential an ingredient, a chief of police's genuine commitment to good governance is to bringing its promise to life. Chief Raymer, you have been a strong and stalwart leader even as we dealt with the huge uncertainties and major challenges created by a global pandemic. You have been compassionate and kind, always recognizing that community is and must be a true partner in policing. You've also been humble and honest with the board, with your members, and with the public. You have been responsive to the public, seeking and listening to the voices of our communities, understanding that the most effective leader is a collaborative one and you have demonstrated through action that working symbiotically with the board even in times of disagreement is essential to delivering the kind of policing the residents of this city deserve you have worked to ensure that our offices work together effectively and consistently keenly understanding that this dynamic creates better outcomes for all and so you will be missed by me, by the members of our team in the office, obviously by the members of the service, and by the members of the communities we serve. You have our deepest gratitude, Chief Raymer, and our deepest respect, and our best wishes 
for a healthy, enjoyable retirement with Marg, your children, and your newly expanded list of grandchildren. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd now like to go through our, our agenda for today. So item number one, the confirmation of our minutes, so November 14th minutes, that's been held. Item number two is also, that's held. Item number three, that's also held. Item four, held. Item five is held. Item six is also held. Item seven, held. Item eight is held. Uh, item nine, I'd like to call for a, a vote for item number nine, a vote to approve. Councilor Nunziata, Mover, Ms. Kasakis, Seconder, Mr. Crisanti, all in favor? Okay, carried. Item number 10 is held. Item number 11 is also held. Uh, and item number 12, we have a vote and also a written deputation. Thank you to Ms. Carrado for her submission. So I get a mover for item number 12. Move to receive item number 12. Ms. Morgan, seconder. Ms. Kasakis, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Okay. I'd so we just returned to the top of our agenda and we have the chief's update. So we'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Pogue uh, for our monthly uh, verbal update. Thank you, uh, Chair Morgan. I'll be delivering this month's update on behalf of Chief Raymer. I'll be focusing on three investigative successes that the service announced since our last board meeting. While each was reported in the media, I nevertheless want to take this opportunity to reiterate these results not just to showcase the outstanding work of our investigators, but also to demonstrate to the board and the community the public safety outcomes that come with sustained investments in our investigative squads. The first is a drug squad investigation done by our major drug squad, the results of which were shared publicly back on November 17th. This months long investigation resulted in the largest single day seizure of illicit street drugs in the history of our police service. It included the seizure of 520 kilograms of crystal methamphetamine and 150 kilograms of cocaine. It's important for the board and the public to appreciate that a single kilogram of either one of these drugs sells for tens of thousands of dollars in its purest form. When cut into smaller quantities, laced with additives to extend their yield and sold at street level, this quantity of drugs would generate millions of dollars in profits for organized criminals and several thousands of dollars for street level dealers who prey on our most vulnerable. This remarkable investigative result by members of our drug squad has not only diverted millions of dollars in profits from organized crime and street gangs, but it has diverted massive amounts of dangerous and illicit drugs from reaching our streets. The sec second investigation, Project Barbell, uh, was originally reported by Chief Framer on December 5th. This investigation was carried out by our integrated gun and gang task force and it, target, it targeted organized criminals who were profiting from the illegal sale of guns. The investigation culminated in the seizure of a distributing arsenal of 62 firearms and large quantities of ammunition. As many of you have seen during Chief's, uh, sorry, our chief's news conference, some of these guns were assault style rifles. It is chilling to consider that each and every one of these guns we allege was destined for our streets and our neighborhoods. Virtually all of the guns were sourced to the United States, smuggled across the border, where they were sold on our streets for huge profits. That anyone would choose to profit from selling drugs that are intended to do nothing less than kill and maim is frankly unconscionable. Six individuals have been charged as a result of Project Barbell, and while this investigation reinforces the extent to which gun and gang violence continue to impact our city, 
It also demonstrates our service commitment to doing all we can to remove and alert, uh, divert illegal guns from our communities and to hold accountable those who choose to sell, carry, and use them. The final investigation I'd like to speak about is a cold case homicide. And it highlights the successful conclusion of the 1983 murders of Aaron <laughs> Gilmore and Susan Tice. Ms. Gilmore and Ms. Tice were br brutally murdered by a single suspect whose DNA was found and preserved from both murder scenes almost 40 years ago. As was discussed at the news conference on December 2nd, our homicide and missing persons cold case section identified, located, and charged Joseph George Sutherland of Moosonee, Ontario with these historical murders. This arrest was the result of a combination of scientific advancements in DNA technology and the persistent and exhaustive police work led by Detective Sergeant Steve Smith and his team. It's important to remember, as was pointed out by Detective Sergeant Smith, that genetic genealogy and DNA matching is not nearly as simple as one may think. It is a tool, albeit a critically important tool, that points investigators to a group, or more accurately, groups of potential suspects uh, that are based on common genetic links. It is then the work of the investigators through traditional investigative means to do the painstaking work of eliminating individuals one by one until a single suspect is isolated and their DNA obtained by ju judicial authorization for comparison. Detective Sergeant Smith will tell you that this was the most complex investigation of his 25 year career. That the service was finally able to bring closure to the loved ones of Ms. Tice and Ms. Gilmore bring a tremendous sense of relief to us. It goes without saying that there is no such thing as a closed murder investigation and that our service will continue our work in this space. In fact, we have 15 additional TPS cases to examine and we are soliciting 15 more cases from other parts of our province, all as part of the province's community public safety grant, which is $1.5 million over three years. I'd suggest that every one of the individuals responsible in these cases ought to know that we are determined to identify them and to find them. I'll conclude my update by pointing out that these types of investigations come with considerable ongoing financial expense, including genealogists, DNA testing, and testing kits and related technology. The grant funding provided to the service by the province has been critical to our success, and I want to acknowledge the province for that. Going forward, it will continue to be critical to facilitating success successful outcomes in our cold case files. So this includes this monthly update, but I, I would just uh, like to take this time um, to speak to one more thing, and uh, that is to acknowledge South Superintendent Randy Carter. Um, Randy Carter, this is his last board meeting as well, and before he retires in the new year. You can see there behind me. Um, I'd just like to, um, to point out that Randy has almost 37 years of experience working with uh, all pillars of our organization. He has demonstrated a true commitment to continuous learning and safer communities. He is a mentor and he's deeply devoted to developing our future leaders. Randy has led and contributed to critical work with many of our partners, some of which include the city's community safety and well-being plan, the board's mental health and addiction advisory panel, alternative mental health responses with the Toronto uh, Community Crisis Service and Gerstein. And Randy is also co-chair of the multi-sectoral gun violence reduction strategy um, steering committee and he's working with our health and safety partners. Um, so again, uh, so many things he's done over his career and he will certainly be, uh, be missed um, and it'd be difficult to, uh, to take over this critical work. So thank you, Randy, for all of uh, your work in this space. We uh, thank you and congratulations on your retirement. We wish you all the best. And that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. And before I turn it open to, um, to the board, I just want to uh, say on behalf of the board, just to uh, uh, Mr. Carter, uh, just thank you very much for your years of dedication. Uh, on a personal note, uh, working with you on the safety file, 
uh, I got to see firsthand your commitment to community safety. Uh, so I just want to uh, say thank you again from the board and from myself on a personal level. So all the best. Now I'd like to open it up to the floor. Councilor Nuziana, go ahead. Just briefly, um, and congratulations on your retirement. Well, thank you. But just, I, I just want to comment on the update that we received. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for the TPS and congratulations on the updates that you gave us today is very important. And I think that needs to be communicated on what's really being done at the Toronto, P at, at Toronto Police Services. And I think that's amazing on what we've been able to do in the announcement that Chief Raymer uh, made a couple of weeks ago. So thank you very much to everyone at the TPS. Thank you. Any other members? No? Okay, we will continue on with our agenda. So item number one, the confirmation of minutes from our November 14th meeting. I know there is a deputation so I'd like to call Mr. Moran up to the floor. You have five minutes, sir. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied in doing so as fraud. God bless his majesty the king and long live his majesty the king. If I have ever led this board to believe in any way that I am a person as mentioned in the definition for deputation in this board's bylaw definition section, then that would be a mistake and that I ask this board to please forgive me. And in recognition of this being her first uh, police board meeting, I was going to point out for um, Councillor Chang but she seems to have left the meeting already um, because of something she said at city council yesterday. This is from the re reference regarding the secession of Quebec 1998 where the Supreme Court of Canada said that democracy is commonly understood as being a political system of majority rule. Notice what that doesn't say, minority rule. It says majority rule. So notice the mistake as I believe the board administrator, Diana, has made a mistake in not mentioning in the minutes, as Mark Grimes' name had been deleted in this board's agenda last month, that former Toronto candidate for mayor Chris Langenfeld explained once again how the Toronto Police Services Board held an illegal meeting, as Section 27.11 of the Police Services Act says, if the position of a member who is appointed by a municipal council or holds office by virtue of being the head of a municipal council becomes vacant, the board shall notify the council, which shall forthwith appoint a replacement. Now, Jim Hart leaving didn't exactly sneak up on anyone at the city of Toronto, right? So this is from R versus Woods 2005, where the Supreme Court of Canada said, forthwith means immediately or without delay. That's from the Canadian Oxford Dictionary. It is for these reasons that we are prohibited on constitutional grounds from expanding the meaning of forthwith in section 254.2 to cover the delays that occurred in this case. Um, Toronto Co Coalition to Stop the War versus Canada Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness 2010, the federal court said, there is no dispute between the parties that the right to freedom of expression under Section 2B of the Charter also protects the listener in that it includes the right to hear and the right to receive information. I say this because I believe, again, Diana made another mistake by not recording in the minutes the moment former board member Mayor John Tory interrupted Chris Langenfeld in the midst of explaining why he felt Chair Jim Hart's legacy would be that of a fascist toady as a result of Mayor Tory's interrupting Chris, I was not able to hear what Chris's rationale was for calling Jim Hart a fascist toady. As such, Mayor Tory violated my freedom of expression, and in particular, my right to hear due to his outburst. This is from Bracken versus Fort Erie 2017, where the Court of Appeal for Ontario said, <clears throat> no doubt they did not like being called liars and communists, but democracy depends upon the free and open debate of public issues and the freedom to criticize the rich, the powerful, and those who exercise power and authority in our society. Debate on matters of public interest 
will often be heated and criticism will often carry a sting. And yet open discussion is the lifeblood of our democracy. And you know what? This will be a surprise to all of you. That doesn't just go for us, the public. That also goes for Premier Ford because people don't realize when he was gearing up to run against Mayor Tory last term before he became Premier, he showed up at a town hall for then Councillor Giorgio Mammoliti. Someone shouted out something to uh, Premier Ford while he was speaking. It kind of stunned him for a bit. He collected his thoughts, and I took a screenshot of what he said. Premier Ford said, you know something? John Tory is a liar. Very simple. So, um, you know, goes for, what goes for the a public goes, it seems, goes for Premier Ford also. So that's all I had to say. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Any question to the deputant? Mr. Chair, I just think it's important uh, to, to be accurate on the record because there were a couple of occasions where the deputant uh, made a suggestion that the board administrator, Ms. Hakeem, made some errors. Um, the reality is that the uh, composition of this board, as I believe the deputant is familiar, is decided not by the board and not by the board office. It's decided by city council and by the province of Ontario. And when those two orders of government make decisions about the composition of the board, our office uh, makes changes to uh, the material that we put out appropriately. And so when we were advised of the composition uh, of the three city councillors that were appointed by city council, our board administrator diligently made sure that the material reflected that. And so I think it's important to make sure that uh, that is said. Thank you. Member Costanti. Do that? All right. Power is on, but not the mic. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for the record, I just wanted to state that Councillor Chang uh, just stepped away briefly. She will be back. Um, just, in, you know, just want to clarify that in case somebody thinks that she did leave, but she did not leave. She will be back. Okay. Thank you for that thank clarification. You. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, I uh, thank you for making that comment, uh, but Diane. But what I don't appreciate, and I know that deputants have the right to speak, but they don't have the right to call us liars. Um, and I think that that should stop at the board meeting. Um, you know, um, if you want to speak on the item before us, you speak on the item. But to call us liars and call the mayor names or any of the board member names, I, I do not appreciate that. And uh, 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 if you don't mind, you don't have the floor. I have the floor. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move on to item number two. And there is, oh, sorry. This is what happens when you're a rookie. <laughs> okay, um, a vote to accept item number one. Confirmation of Ms. Kasakis. Seconder, Ms. Nada. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, item uh, number two. There's a presentation uh, members of Wellness Strategy and Implementation. Update. I just wanted to, while uh, the team is setting up, just take a couple minutes and sort of open um, this item. So uh, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is that some of this work really started um, maybe back in 2018 that's when really the unit kind of was formed as it is um, now uh, ivy was actually brought on in late 2018 um, and by you know 2019 2020 is when the strategy actually came together on um, you know on what the intent ultimately was and so what we're really here to talk about and why we're doing a, a wellness and well-being strategy um, there's kind of four or five big things one of it, one of them is around illness and injury prevention, which in our um, sector is incredibly important given all the dangerous work our members do. 
The other piece of it is when, unfortunately, things do happen, that we're able to seamlessly support our members and that they have access to all of the supports that are available to them as seamlessly and as kind of pain-free as possible. Uh, the third thing around why this is so important is really to normalize the idea of mental health and reduce the stigma so that, you know, we, we do provide incredibly um, kind of sector-leading benefits, but we also want to make sure that not only are they accessible, but people feel it's okay to access them, that it's perfectly normal and okay to do so. Um, the other area is around... Um, our processes themselves. And so what are we obligated to do as an employer? What are our leaders obligated to do? And what does modeling good behavior look like around supporting wellness? Um, and the last two is really around where we aspire to be. We want to be an employer of choice. Um, wellness programs and well-being is one of many ingredients of getting there, but it's a very important one. And in particular, when we think of the current landscape and we every, every service is hiring and when they're contemplating what service to join, for us, this is a key differentiator among other aspects of what we offer as, as a service and as an employer. Um, and so um, we, we've been on this journey and now fast forward a few years and we are starting to see some really tangible results. Um, we are increasing our reach and our participation in terms of the programs we offer, who calls us, the adoption of everything we're putting out. Um, and maybe less subtle and not always measurable is the conversations that happen in the hallway, the conversations that are happening in our interviews. We just finished a suite of senior officer interviews and a running theme throughout all of them was how important wellness was and what have our leaders done to contribute to member well-being? Um, and we're also seeing kind of more visible supports, visible support from our leaders, as well as metrics that do support the idea that we are making inroads, we are seeing improvements, um, we are seeing a much better experience when it comes to return to work, um, that type of thing. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of point out that th this is sort of a, a journey now that's been going on for a few years. Um, there is some much more heavy lifting to still do. We recognize there's more still to be done, but there is a really strong team um, that is very committed to the purpose, and we've certainly enjoyed the support of command um, as well as the board to keep carrying this work on. And so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you to the team and, and recognize kind of the heavy lifting that's gone on while Ivy walks us through some of the updates of, of how this strategy is going. Thank you. just thought I would take us a little bit back to the beginning of our strategy when we put forward about a year and a bit ago to the board just a reminder that um, what, what it's sort of founded on and uh, we do we know that our well-being strategy recognizes four pillars of uh, supporting individuals and in mental health physical health social health and life health with the member whole a whole person uh, approach at the center and we know that members feel uh, that they are more suited to be able to do the do their the responsibilities of their job uh, when they feel supported in their health. Um, with that, we have our strategy in general that is adopting a whole person mindset and puts members and all of their diverse needs at this center. It's, the goals are to expand and enhance the wellness supports and resources for easier access and promoting individual choice and self-care through consumerism versus traditional paternalism. And so it's also just important to, uh, re to to remind ourselves that our definition of health is not necessarily the absence of illness or disease, but actually that everyone has the ability to thrive uh, and with at all different levels of ability within the within the workplace context. And so it's not about only preventing and, and, and diminishing the ability that people are going to get sick or be injured, but what do we do with that afterwards? So in our strategy, um, we put together uh, and identified nine tactics that we were committed to implementing over the following three to five years. We remain uh, committed and accountable to, as a unit and also as a service to, to these tactics. Uh, this slide just is a roll up of all of them and you can see that we have actually um, commenced seven of the nine uh, and we are slated to be working on the remaining two in 20, uh, 2023. 
So I'm going to take us through just a, there's a lot of content here. So I'm going to try really my best to just take us through some salient points on the uh, kind of on each of them where we've seen some, some progress and success. Um, the first is around uh, the, our notion of embedded teams. And what this is translated to is really a regional, delivery, regional service delivery model where um, we have our multidisciplinary wellness teams working together to seamlessly support members at their units and divisions in a dedicated and tailored fashion. And the model, the, one of the, um, the mandates of this model is to be present and to promote member well-being resources and support. Uh, thus far, we've, um, we've implemented this with our safety teams, with our health absence recovery teams, and our chaplains. And in the coming year, we will be adding um, our mental health and well-being resources, including psychologists and well-being coordinators, uh, next year. So far, the feedback has been positive and that met from both supervisors, leaders, and members that the, the, the dedicated resources is, is, um, is well received and, and is providing some element of continuity of care, support, and uh, consistency in terms of delivery. Uh, the next tactic that we have been committed to is moving off-site, essentially, and what that translates to is um, we've actually thought about this in the context of our regional delivery model, and so what we are doing is going to be moving the lion's share of our wellness resources to the Toronto Police College, but also we'll maintain a small uh, regional team at headquarters as well as at an, a location in the east. Um, the impetus to this is uh, around um, removing the perceived and real stigma associated with people coming to headquarters to receive support and over and over again we hear that that is a barrier to access and so we're we've been able to get some commitment to to move forward on this and this is going to be a phased approach that where we see um, over the course of the spring of this year through to the spring of 2024 that we'll be able to realize this full transition um, the next large bucket of work is around integrated health and um, support specifically for absence and illness. So what really this is, is a simplified and integrated claims management program for illness and injury with a focus on early and safe return to function and return work integration. Um, I can't underestimate the and overstate, I guess, how big of a body of work this actually is, and includes a significant amount of day-to-day -day operations and transactions, as well as working with and through a number of long-standing historical practices. Um, and essentially, disability management and occupational health, or occupational health me and occupational medicine, is a continuously evolving expertise, and has seen a tremendous amount of change. Um, evolving practices and increased sophistication in recent years industry-wide. To keep pace with this and ideally to outpace this within an organization it takes um, a considerable amount of effort, nimbleness, tenacity and specialized expertise. And so what we um, really are trying to do is, and this work involves, understanding the nuances of functional abilities, both cognitive, physical, cognitive and psychological, and how to rehabilitate and strengthen those abilities to a pre-injury or illness state, um, but also with the overlay of trying to align that with job demands within an organization. And this is very nuanced and very complex, can be often uh, simplified to can we get people back to work, but there's a complexity associated with that, and that's what this work is really focused on. So what we've um, been able to accomplish thus far this year, in this past year, is we've been able to really get a baseline of a number of job demand analysis for some of our key job categories, which is actually a significant undertaking. Um, we've been able to create a simplified case management process for all injuries and illnesses regardless of their origin, meaning occupational or non-occupational, and we've increased the use of some of the standard disability management tools to support early and safe return to work, such as things like IMEs, functional abilities, um, evaluations, and, and so on. We do also know that the number one way to reduce lost time claims and any of the associated costs, both financial and human, um, is to um, have early intervention through modified work and member support and engagement. We also know that the demands of policing are very complex. They're multifactorial and at times unpredictable and lacking in sustainability. So one of our key objectives of this body of work is to find ways to optimize recovery for members in a timely fashion 
and in a meaningful way that reduces that human and financial cost of illness and injury. Um, so um, the, I guess the next uh, tactic that we have for an update on is the notion of central intake and system navigation. Um, again, one of the most frequent things that we hear from members ongoing is uh, that there's a lack of understanding by our members about what is available to them, how they should access support and resources, and when. And so um, it's an obstacle that we see in the service. It's an obstacle we see in the community and the, the healthcare system at writ large. Um, but one of our goals with this is to reduce the confusion and burden of trying to navigate access for our members when they're at a in a position of needing support. So with a central singular point of contact for support navigation, this is what we're uh, working towards. We, it's important to note that we, we did in some ways pilot this um, in the pandemic uh, when we created our pandemic response um, and pandemic support line, which was essentially a 24-7 hotline that we created for members as a central point of contact for COVID-related items. The, uh, the, the business case or the kind of the return on investment for this we're actually really proud of and essentially what this is is on the, on the left hand side you can see that this is the cost of investing in this in, over the course of two years. You know the amount of law, the cost of implementing the program um, combined with the estimated lost time had there been no intervention there was in and around 61 million dollars. However in the by spending upwards of nine hundred thousand dollars to run this program um, the estimated cost and last time we had a quote with in regards to the pandemic was 35.57 million which essentially is a savings of about 25.74 million dollars over the course of two years by front loading early access and early intervention essentially so this is a really strong model again some people would say this is a return on investment it's a cost savings or a cost avoidance and that's an important uh, it's important to kind of recognize that but it is a really great business case and a proof of concept to move forward on a um, centralized intake for other types of absence and injury and so this is a visual illustration of what this could look like uh, for the for the service and what we are working towards again combined with that overlay of a regional uh, service delivery model so you can see that you know any number this is not exhaustive but illustrative like I said that um, you know any kind of query that would come into the for instance to the wellness unit would be effectively triaged through the central intake team and then uh, piped out to one of the regional service delivery models in a multidisciplinary fashion. So um, that is something that we're actively working on. Um, health promotion has been uh, marquee in terms of some of the things that we've been uh, dedicating our time towards. Um, we've done a lot in this area this past year. And it's been really nice to be able to be focusing on things other than the pandemic uh, and infection prevention and control this year, but also keeping that very much alive throughout the, throughout the course of the year. Um, a couple of key accomplishments here has been, um, and sorry, when we speak about health promotion, one of the key things that we want to do is raise awareness and build skills amongst our membership as part of that health promotion. And so um, one of the big things that we've been able to accomplish this year is a partnership with CIPSERT, which is the Canadian Institute of Public Safety Research and Treatment, as well as Wayfound Psychology and Wounded Warriors, where we've been able to have 2,000 of our members participating in the Before Operational Stress Program, which has been funded through a Canadian Public Health Grant. And so for those of you who don't know, the, the Before Operational Stress Program is a proactive resiliency-based program that uses evidence-based tools to mitigate the effects of operational stress of which we know almost unilaterally all of our members will have experienced at some point in time and it teaches members to manage the effects of that operational stress uh, by learning and using coping techniques. The nice thing about this program also is that we're able to take the learnings and the lessons and the, the themes of this training and build that into um, training for our new recruits as well as our IST and um, we will we also are going to be using some of this common language and themes into our early career program for uh, new members. Um, also, just uh, another piece on the uh, health promotion side is we were able to relaunch our annual wellness day this year with the support of the board uh, and the service, of course, and um, where we actually had over 250 participants attending a full day event with a focus on mental health and well-being. 
Um, 100% of the people who responded to a post-event survey indicated that they found it was helpful, it was useful, that they had a willingness and desire to participate in future events like this, and that they learned something that they would take with them uh, in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, and it's interesting to say that we also had about a 54% response rate on that post-event survey, which is actually a very high volume of people who have provided uh, some feedback. Um, uh, we are also looking to build out the ecosystem of health and well-being supports. We know um, this is multi, there's multi, lots of dimensions to this, but uh, included in this is really a focus on peer support, because we do know that peer support amongst first responders is probably the uh, number one and first uh, first part of that ecosystem where people uh, seek to um, get support from their peers. We've actually, we have for a long, a long time had a peer support program in, uh, in the service, but we do know that we need to optimize that and understand how that actually works for members. And, and so what we have done is initiated an audit of our, full, uh, of our peer support program, of which we'll get the results of that in early, 20, early January. Um, but this will give us a sense of what our, where our strengths are and where our opportunities are for looking to augment that in 2023. We also, um, uh, we also have bit, launched a partnership with St. John Ambulance for a therapy dog program, which would it expands the reach of therapy dogs in, in, for our members. And they are going to be going out to and have gone out to many different divisions and locations. And it's, this is a very well-received uh, program. It's in addition to um, some of the existing um, victim services dogs that have our, that already do provide support here and there to uh, to members. But we re part of our uh, goals is to have um, the ability to expand the scope uh, and reach of some of the things that are available within the service. Um, I think just we wanted to highlight for you that none of this work is happening in total isolation and, and, and entirely alone. We have been able to, and part of our, our initial plan was always to leverage key partnerships and expertise that is out there. This is an example of some of the partnerships that we've been able to uh, nurture this year. The PSHSA, uh, Risk Management Solutions, Mercer uh, Mental Health Innovations, MHI, St. John Ambulance, and also, like I mentioned before, the uh, SIPSERT and WayFound uh, program for before operational stress. Um, Without the help of these organizations, we wouldn't be able to move the things as further along as we have, and so uh, it's, it's great to have that expertise at, at our tables. And then, kind of right, not wanting to diminish this because it's actually such a huge component of the work that we're doing, is um, you know really dedicating a lot of time and muscle and, and energy to data and metrics management. Um, we know that we need to be able to have a lot of things with wellness are about our performance, but also about our uh, experience, both um, quantitative and qualitatively. We are doing a huge amount of work in our, in our unit to be able to kind of mine our systems, optimize the systems that we have in order to be able to produce um, meaningful information to help guide our decision making down the, down the line. And in the future, in in this coming year, we hope to be able to be able to have a um, internal dashboard that has ready available statistics and information to show how we are performing, as well as to give us some indication as to where we, we're seeing some results, where we can add more investment and in both in time and perhaps resources, and also to understand what the trends are moving forward and where we need to spend our um, wellness dollars, as it were. Um, and I'm going to invite Nancy to come up and talk a little bit about moving forward. <clears throat> so thank you for 2023. Um, we are committed to rigorously um, implementing and executing on uh, the member wellness uh, strategy. And so IV has very deeply walked us through the nine tactics, uh, the principles, and Savina has touched on the strategic priorities that we are going to lose, uh, uh, use as our lens uh, to prioritize and assess the work um, of wellness. And um, those tactics obviously have been uh, developed over the last couple of years. Um, they're very foundational to the work that we need to do. And um, uh, we will commit to a rigorous and regular 
review of our tactics on an ongoing basis. Uh, the next big bucket is just generally to support uh, member wellness, and I'm going to offer up organizational wellness as um, a key strategic priority. In other words, the work of the organization and excellent work of the organization of the service cannot be accomplished without excellent individual or member well-being. Um, they're symbiotic. One can't happen without the other. So we hope to be able to be in a position to proactively integrate the concepts of member and organizational wellness into all key decision-making conversations. So that would be um, business plan conversations, corporate strategic planning conversations, of course, budgeting and negotiation conversations. We also want to further develop our key performance metrics. And um, Daisy, uh, Ivy has shown you um, some of the work that has been started, but really we're committed to fleshing and enhancing our key metrics so that we, uh, as a wellness unit and as a people and culture uh, pillar, are best able to provide informed or evidence-based recommendations to the organization at large and just as importantly to frontline operational leaders in terms of how they can best manage and support uh, their members. And the last big bucket we're going to focus on in 2023 is to, I guess, initiate or invite a conversation about the implementation of the Canadian Standard for Psychological Health and Safety and Well-Being in the Workplace. And this standard invites organizations to broaden their definition or understanding or focus uh, from individual or member well-being to taking a holistic view of organizational health and well-being. And we think that given the work that uh, Ivy's team um, and Savina's leadership and others' leadership throughout the last number of years have put us in a position where we can actually use um, the strategy to expand our definition of wellness to the organization at large. Um, and Savina, in her opening comments, uh, quite rightly sort of talked on the war for talent. So in the last number of months, it's no secret that as a, a service, we are now struggling at times um, to meet our staffing requirements. And candidates on the street are looking to work for an employer who is truly authentically committed to not only their individual wellness, but taking a holistic view of all the drivers within an organization that might contribute to their overall wellness. And so we believe um, that we're well positioned. This is great timing to have that conversation. Uh, the People and Culture Strategic Plan or People Plan uh, here at TPS is due for a refresh or a redo in 2023. So that will tie nicely into the work that wellness has uh, done and we will be able to support one another in driving wellness um, to include this broader definition. Pass it back to you. Sure. Uh, that's, that concludes our presentation. Our inlet, if there are any questions. Thank Thank you very much for that. I would just want to open it up to Member Kostakis. You have a question. Thank you. So when you talk about the organizational, and that, that was a preface for one of my questions, is, it's, uh, is, is it safe to say that it's, um, the resources are offered to both anyone in the service, civilian or otherwise? which yes. puts in that holistic approach. Yes. And is there training that comes with that at all for when we talk about peer support or, or mentorships because of the confidentiality and the stigmas, et cetera? Is there anywhere in, in the strategy to have also the training pieces so people are able to identify if someone is in crises or if they're having PTS or any, any other mental health issues, et cetera? Can you speak to any form of future or ongoing or even uh, present training opportunities, whether it's at the leadership level, but I believe it should be from top to bottom, obviously, when identifying that so that there is that holistic approach and also the support internally, but also externally if you need to. Um, so the, so yes, the, yes, the resources that are available are designed to be for all members of the service, sworn, civilian, and otherwise. Um, 
we um, peer support specifically um, in terms of training and um, kind of developing what I would say is a real culture around peer support is really probably the future state of where we want to go. Inherently, people lean on peer support uh, because it's a very collegial environment and first responders have unique experiences amongst themselves, whether it's police, whether it's fire, whether it's paramedics, etc. cetera, um, and from one service to another. Uh, I think our goal is that we would be um, expanding the notion of peer support so that everyone has at least baseline skills and understanding of what, uh, how to identify referrals to, a referral to additional support, whether it's, you know, what's appropriate, what are the boundaries, as it were. Um, and we do expect that that's going to come out of the out of the work that we're doing in this area and, and really will be a focus in 2023. Um, the before operational stress training program does speak to identification of, uh, you know, t um, feelings, emotions, and otherwise. And so uh, one of our goals there is, uh, like I had mentioned, is uh, to build some of that into the curriculum. And we're working very closely with uh, the, the folks, our colleagues at the college, um, to be able to figure out where that can fit in terms of training. It, you know, we that's largely focused on the um, the, uh, the in terms of in, a, annual in-service training that's largely focused on the uniform contingent, but we are looking at ways in terms of f finding ways to bring that training to all of our civilian employees as well. Um, and I would just maybe say that it's a constant evolution, and and you know it's it, we we really are committed to being a voice at the table to say that training in this area is not one and done, and that we need to have a plan year over year in terms of reinforcing some of the uh, the the messages and learnings and the skills, which is part of the reason why we want to be able to uh, um, adopt the the uh, the regional service delivery program where we have resources from wellness who are experts in this area to be. Um, a, more readily available and embedded with the with the, with the service operationally, um, and I, I think that that will evolve as time goes by. And we're already seeing a an, a definite interest, like Sabina mentioned, in people participating and many more people putting their hands up to say, "I'd like to be on, you know, any kind of committee, a team, a, a group, uh, et cetera, at, you know, to be able to to have an impact." Well, no, thank you, and I think it's important, and I, I really do appreciate how difficult it is to and challenging because it's something that's ongoing all the time. All our health and well-being is, is ongoing and present. It's past, so I think it, it really is important at the pre-level before someone is with the service while they're they're being recruited during because everything changes and there's different phases and people having different experiences. And the civilian piece I think is phenomenal because the civilian folks who work with the service are also exposed to what is happening and, and, and also to the individual, but also as an organization. So I, I really do appreciate that. And then just the last uh, question would be, and I think you answered it near the end, is that are people more open to accessing the resources for health and well-being within the service, whether it's civilian or otherwise? Are you seeing I think the an answer increase? is I think the answer is yes. Um, I think that what we don't have a, a very clear view of exactly what they're accessing, um, but I do I, I do think that we are seeing uh, strong indicators that people are accessing support um, more readily, and I think that part of what we are needing to really crystallize for members is what is available for access and how to access it, and so that's a big focus for us. Um, and it, it, you know, the the network is so large, um, and part of the fact that the network is so large and the amount of resources that are available is also an indication that people are seeking support because there's a increased recognition that this is a population that um, that are at times throughout their career needing support, but also um, more willing and able to uh, access it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, first of all, excellent presentation and uh, an excellent support uh, program that you have as well for our members. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't think we can thank our officers enough for the work that they do every day, and and to serve and protect. And, and uh, you know, I just can't imagine how, you know, at, at times how stressful and difficult it, it could be. But you mentioned something earlier that. Um, 
uh, the members are not sure on how to access uh, some of these programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just wondering, in terms of specific outreach programs, uh, what do you currently do it, and what do you plan to do, and can that be improved moving forward into 23? So there is a, a, a very long menu of options and, and uh, available for, for members uh, to, to, to get support. Um, that said, not every support mechanism is maybe the right one for any particular circumstance, and that's mm -hmm. part of the challenge. So um, one of the things that we are excited about and we're in the <coughs> process of, we're in a bit of a blackout, I have to be honest, with uh, the City of Toronto and, and the TTC, so we can't talk too deeply about what some of the things that we're working on, but through that procurement, we're trying to understand what, how can we expand the, the amount of um, kind of services that are available for members through their benefits is right. an example of something that we are uh, working on. Um, when that concludes, we'll have the ability to speak a bit more freely about that. Um, uh, we, you know, we have uh, a, a, n a number of external agencies that are geared to first responders that are partners with us that we refer people to. We have our internal uh, psychologists and well, um, uh, psychologists that help and uh, support members. We have our medical advisory services that also support members in times of absence and illness, um, Ill Ill illness and injury. We have been working with a number of um, agencies that support the WSIB process that is also very um, complicated and uh, difficult to navigate, sometimes not as timely as we'd like to be through no fault of anything but the, 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 the complexity of the system. And so um, we not only are offering resources to people, but we're also trying to find ways to advocate for what resources people might need. Um, and so getting that information and having a, a flow of information is that much more important to us to be able to understand what it is that our members do actually need and want. Um, and also where they don't want to be have, have the service be involved, because that's another very real factor, is that we, we need to allow people to uh, kind of be the architects of where they want to be in terms of accessing care and support, not necessarily entirely um, t uh, getting too involved in, in, the, in the personal choices of personal health information, as it were. Um, if I could just um, That's fine. Thank if you. I could just respond just to the access right. piece because I think that that is a key piece of this. So currently, what we do have is the our internal website's quite robust now with all of the kind of ways, all of the um, sources, all of the resources that are available. So there is at least a central spot where a lot of the inventory of resources and where to go for support is available. It's regularly promoted whenever there is a critical event. Um, we, that is the first thing that's sort of up and running and we make sure people are aware of it. Um, the other piece is that um, the, the intake center, one of the, one of the features of it is system navigation. It is to kind of help navigate um, members that are looking for help on how to access it and determine which one best fits their need. Uh, Vice Chair? Yes, just, just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I'm looking at the return on investment. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a lot. So thank you for that. I mean, wonder what we're doing at the city. <laughs> uh, got budget time. But just that, just that uh, one question about the partnerships, the key partnerships, and we talk about the therapy dog pilot and proactive presence at selected divisions. Can you just expand a bit on that and on that so, program? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have, uh, actually we've been working with St. John Ambulance even before the pandemic in order to try and have uh, a pilot of therapy dogs coming out to kind of proactively, not necessarily in response to a critical incident, but more just, um, periodically kind of going around to various divisions. With the pandemic, it was more difficult. We had to kind of put that on pause for a bit. This year, we've been able to ignite that and start it. So um, what that looks like is that the St. John Ambulance um, ha dog handlers for their therapy dogs will go to on a rotation and on a schedule in a it's all volunteer. Uh, they go and bring their dog to, uh, say, a division where people can spend, you know, whether it's 
let's say it's two hours at a time and anybody who's in that division has an opportunity to kind of engage with that animal. Um, and that's what that looks like. That's, that's essentially what that program is and it's exceedingly well received. Um, it's amazing to see how quickly a uh, you know, these therapy dogs uh, can diffuse, uh, diffuse situations, bring people's um, mind to the moment of uh, engaging with the animal. It's not for everyone. Not everyone loves animals. Not everyone has that experience. But uh, it, is something that, uh, it is something that we generally get really good feedback on. In January, we'll be uh, doing something some, uh, like a real promotion of this with, uh, for in alignment with Bell Let's Talk to sort of t focus on mental health. And uh, we've uh, asked the response. We've actually just sent out a, re um, a, a request to the service for units to kind of let us know when they'd like that, that therapy dog to come. And uh, the, res the, the, the response has been overwhelming. We probably will need to expand that if we, if we, if we can. So that's... That. I, I do know that uh, um, they bring the therapy dogs uh, um, to um, uh, uh, the nursing homes, long-term care mm -hmm. for, for this. Yeah, I, I know that because they did that when my parents were in a nursing home. So, yeah, I, so, so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other members? I just have a, a couple quick questions. And again, thank you for your presentation. It's uh, quite informative. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of, as we know, there's many challenges in terms of accessing supports, um, particularly when it comes to the issues around the stigma around actually accessing uh, some of these pieces. So I'm just wondering, and potentially some of the confidentiality that members might feel um, uh, might be a barrier. So maybe just if you can speak to a little bit about how to that sort of navigated the confidentiality piece and, and, and creating a great opportunity for um, uh, support. So confidentiality uh, is, a, is a very real factor and, and trust and, and confidence in the, resor in, the, in, the, in the services that we have. Uh, we are seeking to kind of um, work on that incrementally uh, as the more we go down the path. And, um, you know, in terms of another thing that we, you know, just about speaking about training opportunities, uh, I think about that for supervisors. Uh, there's an opportunity for supervisors to be, you know, re-educated re and have it be reinforced around what the boundaries of uh, confident support and confidentiality are. You know, I think that in a in an environment where um, relationships are so alive and so important in the work that we do uh, trying to figure out how to how to create those boundaries of confidentiality uh, is a challenge um, we are looking to do some you know very structured kind of education sessions around confidentiality for personal health information and what that looks like um, but we I guess we're putting a lot of uh, a lot of confidence in our own ability to, um, through a lot of the health promotion activities, to make sure that we're reinforcing through that being pre present and promoting at units and divisions and conversations with members that confidentiality is important, that stigma uh, is real, that we want to normalize accessing of care, and so finding ways to kind of say that it is normal and it is um, good self care to be um, accessing support is. Um, we're putting a lot of stock in, in the impact that that's going to have, and I think that we are starting to see a little bit of a cultural shift. That said, um, you know, it's a it, disclaimers on confidentiality is consistently important um, f for all the reasons that you you've said that can be a barrier. So, thank you. And and second, please, um, just uh, given the the number of different uh, members within a service and I'm just wondering in terms of the, the how sort of culturally responsive in terms of your approach how that works with different identities and and the intersectionality that that comes within that just mm -hmm. how that piece is sort of approached um, I, so we have uh, right now been working with our EI and HR our equity inclusion and human rights group to to try and find some really good um, skill upskilling and training for our internal resources to be able to ensure that we are being culturally sensitive and that we are being able to um, respond with the right um, 
whether it's the right language, right, right resources, right um, approach to dealing with a di diverse population. That is something that we're in the current currently exploring and we have identified that as an opportunity for our team um, as well as being able to make sure that we have various um, lists of resources that are culturally specific or um, group specific that people are um, able to access and we can at least share that with people but I think that that's also a work in progress thank you thank you again for your presentation thank you So I'd like to have a, a motion to receive. Yes, I'll move receipt of the presentation. Seconder, uh, Mr. Crisanti. Uh, yes, sorry, I know that um, there was a deputation that was written for uh, Ms. Uh, Corrado, so I just want to thank her for that. And again, um, a motion to receive. We did that. Um, seconder, all in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Item number three, we have a number of deputants for item number three. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I want to say off the bat that um, in terms of defining what the problem is, I think only about um, one percent of uh, police complaints ever lead to a hearing. So what I'm basically asking for is something called a 120 days anonymous uh, police complaints uh, transparency bylaw. Now this is something that uh, both the board and the chief have power to uh, implement. Now, uh, and this also is something that disproportionately affects indigenous people, visible minorities, and female police officers. I'll also say that I'm not anti-police. Um, I, I don't support uh, defund the police. However, I do support detasking the police. And I think that there's been a lot of good leadership work done by this board on detasking the police. And I hope that... Um, Organizations, uh, police organizations across the country and even abroad uh, copy some of what has been done here, as well what has been done on wellness. So, but herein being the issue that even if 10% um, of the police force uh, have conduct issues, they could end up tarnishing the uh, reputation of 90%. So I would actually argue that the uh, greatest victims of, uh, of bad cops will be good cops. And so I wanted to say, just to, uh, and it, it's not just misconduct. We're also talking about uh, service complaints, policy complaints, uh, internal complaints. And just to give an example uh, of a policy complaint, because I know that for set, some of these complaints or issues people would be familiar with, Certainly when it comes to uh, uh, visible minorities or, or the black. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, or, or the black community. So, but for example, um, there's been uh, recent challenges to do with female, um, female media personalities and as well female uh, media politicians. So if, for example, there's a, a policy complaint that says, uh, section 175 of the Criminal Code says it's a crime to cause a disturbance by uh, screaming, shouting, swearing, using insulting or obscene language. And then uh, 265 of the Criminal Code says uh, if you attempt to threaten, so not even threaten, and the other person has the uh, believes that you have the ability. So what, what I'm basically going to is that what's the police policy on making threats of violence against female politicians. Now, someone who makes that complaint to say, what is the police policy? The public should have a right to see what the response of the police is. And then the other thing uh, is that, to show you just the merit of what I'm asking for, for the ombudsman to be charged with this, 
uh, is that there have been about five private organizations, mainly academics, uh, lawyers, one in Alberta, uh, four in the States, who have tried to do uh, police misconduct databases at various levels. But they're, of course, limited because they're only going by public information. Uh, but again, if, if it never gets to a hearing, uh, and bearing in mind only 1% get to a hearing, so basically you have 99% of complaints, there is no, um, there's no public uh, disclosure or transparency. Now, the other thing to state where, where uh, the board should feel that they're on solid ground is that the Comprehensive Policing Act, which has not yet been enacted, but it was proclaimed, I think, was well, not been proclaimed yet, but it was uh, passed in 2019. Now, it already brought a, a major change where it said that uh, in section 165 and 167 that if, if there's a complaint and after it's been investigated, if it does not lead to a conduct hearing, it should be disclosed publicly on the internet. And as well, they said after 120 days, there should be um, regular notices going out to the complainant. So again, the province has already indicated uh, that there uh, this is the direction they want to go. So my argument would simply be that since the board and the police have power to implement this, uh, there's no reason not to move forward. Um, I think that my time is running out. I was hoping that I could speak to the gaps in terms of what the province is proposing and uh, what, you know, why that's not, why that's not sufficient. It's 25% of the problem, but it doesn't solve the other 75%. So hopefully, if I'm, I'm given that opportunity to speak, I'd like to, to comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Harman. We, we might have an opportunity to open up to the members if there are questions. And we'll follow up with that. So members, any questions to the deputant? OK. Well, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, you had mentioned uh, a point around um, how to better service um, the community. I just maybe if you can speak a little bit about what you'd like to see differently when you talk about what's being done well. So maybe just talk a little bit about that. If you want to share a little bit about what um, what you feel is being done well. Well, uh, <laughs> being done well. Um, I, I, I'm more commenting about what's what's not being done well because, like I said, only one percent of complaints are public. And that's if it goes to a hearing. The Ontario Civilian Commission, they're also public on Canley, uh, but that's a different uh, appeal process. But we have major issues with, number one, complaints that are dismissed, uh, whatever for whatever reason, if they're not serious or out of perception. Then there's also an issue of internal complaints from other female police officers. Then there's complaints where the investigation is not completed. Then there's complaints where um, a decision is not issued. So sometimes you can have four years, no decision. And in New Brunswick um, and New Newfoundland, the maximum is uh, 90 and 60 days respectively with, without permission for extensions. So what I'm simply saying is that since the uh, Ontario government and the OIPRD have already created a 120 days benchmark, what I'm simply saying is that after 120 days, the public should have a right to see that complaint online and see whatever decision or lack of decision, uh, if there's a need for any redaction, and when the investigation is complete, we'll be able to see whether that reduction was, uh, was um, well, you know, was truthful or not. So the, 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 so I guess the, fo the focus of the complaint is just saying that only 1% is public. So 99% is not transparent. And like I said, service complaints are not uh, even, public, policy complaints are not even public. And I gave an example of asking the police to disclose their policy on um, complaints uh, of threats of sexual assault, threats of violence against female politicians. You know, I, I would argue that, you know, intimidation is not conditional on intent. Uh, uh, threats of assault is not conditional. I read from 265 and 174. So what is the police position? Because some people feel it's legal to um, make threats of sexual assault or threats of physical violence against female politicians. So that's just an example of a policy complaint. I mean, th th there are others. You know, there's people in the Chinese community 
complained about intimidation and that the police do nothing. So that's another example where what's the police policy, uh, you know, with foreign government, um, you know, when, when things happen on Canadian soil. So th there's a whole slew of examples and I'm not even going into, you know, disproportionate use of force or, you know, some of the issues that um, indigenous and black people face from the police. So for the whole argument, and I'm not, I'm not saying that transparency would be a panacea, but what I'm saying is that it's at least the first start where everybody's on the same page because right now, only the, the, the chief and the investigator would know the details of the complaint. So for example, one of the uh, things that I've highlighted is that the province is not, um, my goodness. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? So, yes, we can. Uh, so, yes. Ms. Alwendi, thank you. I know that um, uh, obviously this is uh, quite important to you and we want to give an opportunity to, for a response. So I want to turn this over to Mr. Teshner to provide uh, some information. Yeah, uh, we appreciate your deputation very much. You made a few points, so I just want to try and deal with them in some, in some order. Uh, first of all, as, as you quite rightly noted, the uh, issue of police conduct complaints is one that is legislated to the Office of the Independent Police Review Director. That office is a provincial independent body that manages a public complaint process and also investigates policy and service complaints, which you also mentioned. The OIPRD is the body that makes determinations about what information is made public, uh, a lot of information is public on their website and uh, obviously when you're dealing with individual matters of conduct, some of that information at certain points in the process must uh, main, remain confidential because the Police Services Act speaks to some of those confidentiality obligations. But you did reference some of the police reform work that the board and the service is engaged in and so I do want to bring your attention if you weren't aware of it that one of the board's 81 uh, directions on police reform talked exactly about your point, bringing enhanced transparency uh, to the disciplinary hearing process. And so as a result of that direction, the service has actually created a place on their website uh, where you can access information about the disciplinary hearings uh, process, including a schedule of upcoming hearings and decisions made by the tribunal that are posted directly onto the service's website. So I think some of what you've talked about is actually available now as a result of, of the work that you referenced. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that, recognizing obviously that there are certain things that in any context, policing or otherwise, because you're dealing with human resource decisions, uh, remains confidential up to a certain point in time and sometimes permanently, uh, depending on the nature. But in terms of the transparency of the disciplinary process, uh, if you go to uh, tps.ca, there is a dedicated page to all of this information. Thank you, Mr. Teshner, and thank you, Deputy, for uh, sharing. Um, no, I, we need to move on to the next deputy, but I, I do, we did give you uh, some additional time. So we provided you an opportunity. We can, if you'd like to email, we can maybe speak to you separately, be outside of this uh, session, but we want to be able to honor the other folks that are also here. So uh, thank you again for your deputation. And Duby, could we have the, um, the next deputant, please? Yes, Chair. Uh, next deputant is uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hello. Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, provide my very first deposition. Um, this is, um, I'm really um, glad to be here. And I want to thank um, my, the deputants beforehand and everybody in the committee uh, and uh, who everybody's a part of the meeting today. Um, I also um, want to um, kind of like double down on what the first deputant who did uh, the deposition on the, on the previous meeting minutes, um, his disclaimer or kind of his like um, speech in the beginning where he says he does not provide consent to anything. I kind of want to like use that for myself as well, if that's okay. I never thought about that. 
<laughs> but that would be helpful. Um, so uh, get specifically to, um, I guess, the, um, the agenda item, and this is for the draft MOU between the, the Arbison's office and the board with Toronto Police. Um, I kind of went through the draft, and and I, from my understanding, it was based off of a recommendation from the, um, the the police report that was submitted a while back ago. And that report and, and its recommendation and the essence of that and the essence of the draft MOU, I feel like are a bit misaligned in a sense. The MOU draft kind of comes from a more of a corporate, you know, business to business relationship rather than how the recommendations in the report kind of speaks to a more of a collaborative and um, supportive relationship between all parties. But that element of all parties is missing from the draft one with you. For example, it says um, to only have specific, um, um, that the, uh, the officer office reports directly to the board or the Toronto police through the chief of, of police, but doesn't include a community group or other um, stakeholders who might not be, um, might not ha have the opportunity to voice their, uh, their concerns. So maybe I would suggest the kind of before moving forward on a motion on the MOU because this is going to be legacy work and it's really if we don't get it right the first time, a lot of people, and a lot of times, a lot of minority people voices are. are and concerns are, are not heard. So maybe before motioning to move forward with this, we can set up a, uh, a, a working group in, in, in a balanced stakeholder uh, matrix where stakeholders have opportunity to provide uh, recommendations on how to improve the MOU to ensure that it is a um, collaborative and community-first approach. And that's kind of... And, and to be honest, like, I'm just a... I'm I'm a second year uh, student, university student, and and I have been doing a lot of community work for a lot of years, and I've always noticed that once folks just invite others to have a conversation, it kind of really provides um a better buy-in, and ensures that there's a stronger um relationship for future opportunities, like future collaboration. So I kind of want to bring that perspective from a youth. And this is kind of my first time, so I'm sorry if I'm not doing it in the in the most formal or elegant way, but I feel like it's an opportunity. And also another thing is that maybe um, access to information so more youth like myself can, um, like when I say access to information, like if, if I feel like more youth will uphold their civic duty to be part of this process and kind of provide their perspective and insight if they knew about this information, I think maybe it would be great if, you know, the board and the board can think of how it can further its communication reach and ensure that more youth are having opportunities and hearing what's happening, uh, you know, in action live with, you know, the elected officials. So more youth will be more inspired to take part of the process and provide opportunities. And because if we don't voice our voices, if we don't, uh, um, have opportunity to rally our voices. Um, how can we, you know, <laughs> how can we like? A lot of times, people expect the the young people of today to be the, uh, to us to be the leaders of tomorrow. But how can we be the leaders of tomorrow when we don't have an opportunity to lead now? So that's why I'm. It's this is kind of nerve wracking for me, but that's why I'm kind of speaking up, and it really speaks to like no providing accountability and provoking, uh, invoking transparency and making sure it's a, a, um, a collaborative relationship between all constituents, all stakeholders, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Kanasha. And again, as, as you are being your first deputy, I appreciate you taking the time to do so. We do have the ombudsman here, and, and hopefully you continue to listen. You might be able to provide some of the answers you're seeking. So again, thank you for your deputation. And I would like to uh, call the next deputant uh, in person. But before we get, sorry, that just for one second, Miguel. Just if there are any questions to the deputant.
Ms. Kasakis? It's not. It's a question. I would like to just ask the deputant: Would he be willing to spread the information and and to notify other youth of these opportunities to do what he also did, but also if he'd be willing to inform um, and take a lead on that also with his fellow youth? Thank you. Uh, can I respond? Yeah, go ahead. Um, absolutely. So I'm part of a, a, a youth group of university students uh, at uh, the University of Toronto, and we share information like this and even job opportunities and scholarship uh, or grant writing uh, sessions and even like Know Your Rights sessions. And uh, we are always sharing information. So if it's an other opportunity, we make sure to share it out. And actually, um, matter of fact, I only came to know about this whole meeting is because um, I'm going through a, a process with the, um, um, the Toronto police where I'm trying to request information, but they've been giving me a lot of difficulties. And that's a kind of like, unfortunately, and then one of the individuals, Ian Williams, I think the director of the access and privacy section has kind of like not been acting in accordance with standard operating procedures and releasing um, requests for information in, in within 30 days but has been lagging for over like 90 days and this is actually affecting me and 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 me and the other youth because me myself I'm homeless right now and so I've been trying to um, get the paperwork for my police reports and provide for my dispute but they are declining uh, take uh, really dragging the feet and and I'm trying to uh, fight homelessness and this is kind of yeah. something that well, how I came about to know about this, and Thank that's why I wanted to speak to that. And then once I saw the whole MOU, I said, oh, I should probably provide a one, two comments. Yes, and I, we appreciate your comments, and I think, I, again, for your deputation. Uh, we'll move on to the next deputant, uh, Miguel. Also, I just don't want, I want to co confirm that sorry, I don't sorry, to we, sorry, we've moved on to the next deputant. Again, thank you for uh, your deputation, uh, Miguel. Thank you. Do hope you get reappointment by the province next year. Thank you so much. So I have followed the office of the Ombudsman since 2009 when uh, Fiona Kring was elected as the first Toronto Ombudsman. Mr. Addo, former boss, so he's here today, he's gonna to be presenting his presentation. So I have a long time relationship with the Ombudsman Office since 2010, bringing complaints about City Hall, divisions, boards, commissions, and other agencies. When I requested to investigate the police service board and the service, it was not possible at the time, back in 2010. 2022, today is a reality. It's a small beginning in the right direction a small attempt to rein in this police service. So the Ombudsman reached uh, MOU, but at the same time, the Ombudsman will not be able to investigate complaints against individual officers or matters under review by other oversight agencies. We know that the MOU comes without teeth or enforcement. But I'm glad to hear about DP, uh, TPS uh, providing um, information about hearings and the status of complaints uh, on the website. And we know that OPRD is um, it's a waste of time to go and complain about police uh, officers. We know it's, it's a waste of time. We know that also that Premier Doug Ford, and I'm going to call him a liar in public, when he took power in 2018, basically he undo what we activists have worked very, very hard with the previous Liberal government of Caitlin Wynn at the time with regards to necessary changes to the Ontario Police Act to address acts of discipline, termination, and accountability of police officers. So I want to bring to attention to the Ombudsman here present today that on last November the 23rd, when John Tory uh, got uh, his first day in council as third term, it was, an, it was not a public meeting, it was by invitation only. Um, you see this poster right here, it says, welcome to the indigenous celebration. I happen to be indigenous. And I, and I told the um, security, am I allowed to participate? No, where is your invitation, Miguel? 
So that's something that you need to investigate. And I have a video, by the way, so you're gonna have some fun watching that video. Police were calling to City Hall to remove us. I was with other group of people during a public conference about the third term of John Tory and why it's, it's, a, uh, it's negative to support Bill 39, the super mayor's powers. So the reason why corporate security called Toronto police was because someone yelled, someone screamed, apparently. I don't understand why we need to uh, justify the use of, misuse of taxpayers' money for someone who has yelled. I guess what? I did jail at John Tory yesterday at city council at the end of the meeting. Why? Because I was the only member in the public <laughs> and I was being harassed by corporate security twice. One for drinking a, a glass of water that Councillor Cole handed over to me and two, because I was talking to my daughter who was having a crisis. I was up in the press gallery where there was nobody there was nobody in, in, in the area, and I was told to go back to my seat. Wow, indeed. So, good news, the police was not called by corporate security because I happened to jail at John Tory at the end of the council meeting. So, thanks goodness for that, that we didn't have to waste any money on police officers to come and deal with it. And thank you, John Tory, if you're listening today. Thank you for coming to me and talk to me as a human being about my, my problem with corporate security. But we can go further than that. We can have the officer and ombudsman review the procedures because they're going overhead. In my opinion, they're exaggerating the, the policy of entering, leaving the council. And most important, my friends, I need to ensure that the voices of indigenous people are always respected. And as I said, I have this this picture right here, it says right here, welcome to the indigenous welcoming ceremony. And I was not allowed to be partic a participant of that event. Shame, shame, shame. Thank you, that is my deputation for today. Next deputant. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Morgan. Um, and I'd just like to uh, echo the comments of the earlier university student who spoke about needs for greater public involvement and inclusion. Of course, the if the board wishes to promote and increase public involvement, it's important that the public not be repeatedly facing efforts to stifle their exercise of free speech. And that's an issue that's uh, commonplace at this board or has been in the past. Um, on to this uh, memorandum of understanding with Ombudsman Toronto, uh, looking at the uh, introduction report for that um, at the top of page three, it speaks of, quote, to bring Ombudsman Toronto's unique expertise in the area of administrative fairness to bear on the relationship between the board, service, and members of the public, close quote. And uh, clearly, if you want to... Uh, bring fairness to uh, the public, you have to involve the public in that. And that's what others have brought up. And, and that's uh, certainly an issue I'd say here. Looking down at the memorandum of understanding itself uh, at page 6.10 of the uh, memorandum, uh, 10, Ombudsman Toronto will not investigate A, complaints from members of the public, TPS personnel, or any other person. And uh, I'd say the Ombudsman should, nay must, accept complaints from the public and others, including TPS personnel and other individuals, where they do not fall into the category listed below there in sections 10B through D, those being complaints and uh, employment relations matters and things like that, uh, which obviously are uh, subject to other legislation and so the ombudsman would not have the option to deal with those. But in any other case, uh, the public must be able to complain to Ombudsman Toronto, um, if it doesn't fall into those areas, uh, of what use is a reviewer of fairness issues who refuses to accept complaints about unfair treatment? Um, and in uh, Section 10D there, it refers to uh, 
where there are other adequate remedies under the law or existing administrative practices that uh, that in those cases the ombudsman will be excluded from dealing with them. But the question there is who decides whether or not, quote, adequate remedies exist elsewhere. And so it should be clear in the memorandum of understanding that the ombudsman alone makes that determination. Um, moving down to the uh, definitions in this report uh, in section 15, uh, the first definition there, board office, and it says board office means the staff team supporting the board represented by the executive director and chief of staff of the board or their delegates. No, is the simple answer to that. The board is defined by statute as a group of seven, soon to be nine, appointed officials, not clerical staff. The board is statutorily precluded under Section 34 of the Police Services Act from delegating anything except to, dele quote, delegate to two or more of its members, close quote. Uh, Section 34 of the Police Services Act says, delegation, 34, a board may delegate to two or more of its members any authority conferred on it by this act, except A, which is repealed, and B, the authority to bargain under Part 8, which the board may delegate to one or more of its members. So it specifically says there is no circumstance other than uh, uh, the salary negotiations that uh, may be de delegated to anything less than two of its members. So you certainly don't get to delegate your authority to an employee uh, who is unelected, unaccountable, um, who we have a lot of problems and see, have seen a lot of problems with uh, in the past uh, in terms of competence. Moving down to section 32 of this uh, memorandum of understanding here, uh, again, it refers to the board office, and indeed, there's more than a dozen references to the board office here. In fact, this should be all issues of the board should be dealing with, not the board administrator or, or I should say, uh, executive director uh, or anyone else uh, on the staff. Uh, they can make recommendations to the board, and the board can then deal with things. Uh, going to Section 32 here of the MOU, uh, it speaks of the board office. It would, in fact, seem to be a crime for a worker, worker of the board to withhold information from board members, just as it would be for one member to keep information secret from other members. And 32 says TPS and the board office will limit access to the preliminary investigation report to personnel necessary to respond to the preliminary investigation report. So this is a situation of information being withheld. All right. Um, uh, members, do we have any questions or comments for Mr. Langefeld? I also just want to um, just uh, acknowledge a written submission by Ms. Corrado, uh, and I just want to now turn it over to Mr. Teschner uh, to provide some comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. As you'll see from my report, I'm recommending today that the board approve this memorandum of understanding with Ombudsman Toronto. This MOU responds to the board's direction of August 2020 for me as executive director to, quote, engage with the city manager and discuss additional and alternative approaches to ensuring transparent auditing of police practices and policies. That was recommendation 29 of the board's 81 police reform recommendations. The board office, and I will thank Doobie Cannon Gisser for a tremendous amount of work and James Cornish uh, from the Chief's Office for a tremendous amount of work. We reached out to Ombudsman Toronto in late 2020 to explore options to get the Ombudsman involved in supporting the oversight of the Toronto Police Services Board. We were pleased to find a willing partner who worked diligently with us to develop this new and novel relationship. Subsequently, the Ombudsman has received the support of City Council to pursue this partnership and Council provided necessary resources to the Ombudsman's office in this regard. The MOU continues the work that the Board Office has engaged in over the past years with and on behalf of the Board and further expands the resources available to the Board to carry out its oversight and governance functions. Through this MOU, the Board will gain access to the unique expertise of the Ombudsman's office to investigate matters of fairness and make sure that the service provided by the Toronto Police Service to its clients, to the people who live, work and visit in Toronto 
is of the highest quality. These investigations will be carried out by the Ombudsman in complete independence, from the selection of topics to reporting and following up on implementation of the recommendations that the Ombudsman makes. This relationship will further strengthen, we believe, the trust the people of Toronto can have in the accountability of the Toronto Police Services Board and the Toronto Police Service, and in the oversight provided by the Board and other policing oversight bodies that have authority over the service. Recognizing the diver diverse landscape of legislated agencies and other oversight bodies already in play within the policing context in Toronto, the MOU was developed to avoid duplication of work, that was also City Council's direction, and make sure that the resources made available by the Ombudsman for this purpose are used in the most appropriate way possible. To achieve that, the MOU stipulates that the Ombudsman will not investigate matters that already fall under the jurisdiction of another oversight agency or that are already being investigated by a coroner's inquest, an independent civilian review, or the Auditor General through our Memorandum of Understanding with that office. This includes, of course, matters of conduct, which are the purview of the Office of the Independent Police Review Director, and complaints that must be addressed to the OIPRD. The Ombudsman will also not investigate matters pertaining to employment or labour relations, which again are dealt with and overseen through the Board and by other bodies. This new and novel relationship between the Board, the Service and Ombudsman Toronto will help to enhance trust in the police and improve services to the people of this city. The Service has expressed its commitment to work collaboratively with the Ombudsman, much as it has worked already collaboratively with the Auditor General of Toronto, to ensure the success of this relationship. We at the Board Office also stand ready to support the Board in whatever way necessary to ensure success. Ombudsman Kwame Addo is present here today, and I understand he would also like to make some comments ahead of the Board considering the MOU. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I want to echo the sentiments of Mr. Teschner. Those who know me, I know, know me that I'm a man of few words, so I'm gonna keep my remarks brief today. But first, I want to acknowledge, as Mr. Teschner did, the cooperation extended throughout the process by the board's representatives, Duby Kanagieser and Ryan Teschner, and the TPS representative, James Cornish. They work collaboratively, collaboratively with my office on this agreement. I also want to recognize the support for this initiative from the outgoing Chief of Police, James Raymer, and I look forward to working with incoming Chief Demko as the office begins work in this new area. Finally, I want to acknowledge the support provided by the former board chair, Jim Hart, and his efforts to ensure that the parties could come to terms and finalize the agreement that is before you today. I believe this is a good news story. This agreement recognizes the independence of our office and allows us to satisfy the direction of council to conduct investigations with regard to the fairness of Toronto Police Board service policies and procedures and the goal of achieving better services for the public. This initiative, if adopted, will be a positive and important step for the people in Toronto and will demonstrate that Ombudsman Toronto, the board, and the Toronto Police Services mutual commitment to accountability. <coughs> I look forward to working constructively with individuals, community organizations, who we, have, who we have already begun meeting with to hear their feedback, the police service, and the board on this new initiative. Those are my remarks for this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair? Yeah, it's just briefly. Um, so thank you very much for being here, and you're right, it, it is a good news sto uh, uh, story. Now, as you mentioned, so, uh, the, um, the motion went through Council in April 2021, uh, which was adopted unanimously um, by Council. 
and as you mentioned, you've been working uh, with the chief and the former chair. Uh, so what we have before us and the report and the MOU, you're 100% satisfied on uh, the wording? I believe that this, excuse me, <laughs> I believe that this agreement um, maintains our independence, which is key to the work that we do. As Mr. Teshner said in his remarks, it allows us to identify issues that we feel need to be investigated. Uh, the process that we are going to follow with this new area of jurisdiction doesn't differ from the process that we currently follow with uh, investigation of other city divisions. Um, so we will you know, research um, and identify issues to investigate. We will issue public reports. So the, the work that we do in this new area will be transparent. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, I'm one of the new kids on the block, so <laughs> just uh, um, I think it's it's good to have independence uh, and to be able to examine policies and procedures. And there, the, you know, I know there are constituents that are tuning into the YouTube for the first time ever, perhaps today. And uh, it's a learning to, um, about this. So I just want to um, make clear that for those uh, people who do have grievances about the police um, or work grievances, there are independent bodies and processes already in place. Um, and it's, it's, that's why this memorandum does not include those, those pieces. Is that correct? Uh, through, the, through the board chair, yes, councillor. Um, when uh, council decided in the spring of 2021 to provide our office with this new area of oversight, they did make it very clear that our work shouldn't <laughs> duplicate existing uh, oversight. And so that's why um, the, the concerns that you identified uh, in your question uh, would be addressed by other uh, oversight agencies that are currently in existence. But if individuals do contact our office, that doesn't mean we won't listen to them. We will direct them to the appropriate body. And uh, we will also make note of what they have to say, um, as that information may be helpful in helping us decide uh, future investigation topics. So I guess my question is, um, you, you mentioned that you will your office will be identifying the issues uh, with regard to policies and procedures. Where will you source information and data that will help you determine which areas would, should be examined? So it would be not unlike what we do now. We, we do our own research. Uh, we review existing uh, policies and procedures. We engage with uh, key stakeholders to get an understanding of what issues um, are important to them. So we'll use that information and analyze it and identify and determine what, uh, what are appropriate um, investigations for us to pursue. Does that mean that the public is invited to contact the Ombudsman Office uh, if they have concerns about policies and procedures uh, to uh, perhaps inform your decision making? So, um, as you, as you know, we are, not, we are not able to take individual, we're not going to be investigating individual complaints. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I said previously, if um, members of the public uh, contact our office, we'll be willing to listen to them. And as part of our work, we will be engaging with key stakeholders to get an understanding of what issues are important to them. I think it's important, as I think one of the early deputants said, that um, we hear from, from all stakeholders. And the other thing that I, I have forgot to mention is that our approach is going to be uh, through a systemic lens. We're going to take a systemic approach through our reviews. And so any issues that we identify or any gaps that we identify, we will um, attempt to address through making recommendations that will prevent the issues from reoccurring or um, provide improvements to, to the process. Great, and just one last question. Do you feel you have access to all the information that you need to identify the key areas that need to be investigated? I believe that this agreement allows us to do the work that we need to do and have, allow us to have access to the information we need to, to carry out this work. I, I wanna stress again that uh, to this point, 
We've had nothing but good cooperation from all the parties that were uh, involved in uh, arriving at this agreement, so I don't anticipate that that should change. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Any other members? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Addo. I think this is a, a, an exceptional partnership, and I look forward to uh, the work ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll move the recommendation. Do I have a, a seconder? Ms. Kostakis? All in favor? Okay. Carried. Item number four, we do have a couple of uh, deputants. Uh, Doobie, Mr. Lowry. Uh, Steve Lowry. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to start my video. There. Oh, okay, can you? Whoops. Thank you. Um, Jennifer and I are going to be speaking about the, the end of the term of the Mental Health and Addictions uh, Advisory Panel to the board. And uh, we've been privileged to serve as community co-chairs for the Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel since its establishment in 2019. And Jennifer and I have been involved with Toronto Police for many years preceding that. Um, as you know, uh, the Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel plays a crucial role in connecting your board and service to the mental health and addictions community. We've regularly discussed and reviewed progress on the mental health strategy. The key areas for discussion have included um, training, data collection, de-escalation, uh, and the development of community-based alternatives to police response to people in crisis. We've also uh, had uh, most recently a presentation on officer wellness, and we support the initiatives that you heard about today. Um, as the board knows, police response to crisis is often the result of underfunded community mental health and addiction services in Toronto and elsewhere. Um, we hope that the board will continue to advocate for increased funding for community-based health, uh, mental health and addiction services by the provincial government. Um, as the board knows, uh, the city has uh, uh, implemented a community crisis pilot, uh, and we hope that both you uh, and the board will uh, the service and the board will use the results of the evaluation of the community crisis pilot to support advocacy in this area with the provincial government. Um, the Toronto Police Service is making progress on its mental health strategy and uh, the, the Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel have appreciated the opportunities to discuss the strategy, raise questions and provide suggestions. One area that has seen limited progress is the evaluation of training that officers uh, receive. While uh, the Toronto Police Service and the college have developed a very comprehensive approach to training with an emphasis on de-escalation, aside from the scenario-based training it, discussed, it conducts, there is limited knowledge about whether officers retain their training and how the training helps them respond to people in crisis. As you know, the LOCU inquest recommended developing a written examination to test competency. The Toronto Police Service is now beginning discussions with Humber College about this, and we recommend working with organizations re representing people with lived experience to establish what criteria would be best met for evaluating competency on the de-escalation of people in crisis. And we hope you will uh, direct uh, the new chief to um, uh, make some progress on this area and put in place uh, an approach to measuring competency around de-escalation. We also want to uh, con commend the uh, data and analytics group uh, at Toronto Police Service for their work on the public dashboards and race-based data. Th these data will be an important source of information for public engagement and for MAP to review in the years ahead. Um, we would also suggest that the board continue its practice of making Section 11 reports publicly available following SIU investigations concerning the deaths or injuries to people in crisis. MAP would benefit, for example, from an opportunity to review and discuss the Section 11 report on the death of Regis Korczynski Paquette. We hope that Toronto uh, Police Service will continue to develop uh, mechanisms to engage people with lived experience to share their experience on interactions with the police. We suggest working with the CAMH Empowerment Council and other mental health and addiction stakeholders to develop a research project on this. Finally, we want to thank Jim Hart and Lisa Kostakis for their support of the Mental Health and Addictions Advisory Panel, uh, and Sandy Murray in particular, who has provided unflagging staff support to our work. 
Also, we appreciate uh, the wise counsel of Ryan Teschner and Fred Fisher, and also the support that Doobie has been giving us. So uh, uh, that, that brings my remarks to an end, and it's been a pleasure uh, to serve uh, you for the last three years. Thank you. Comments? Thanks again, Mr. Lari, for your uh, presentation. I have a few words, but I'll uh, share that in a minute. Uh, do we have the, the next deputant? Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to underline the thanks that my excellent co-chair, uh, Steve Burris, just gave for, on both of our behalf. And I decided to address you today as Executive Director of the Empowerment Council to emphasize the importance of centering the voice of people with lived experience when making decisions about people in crisis. So the need identified in previous submission today for police officers to feel safe by concealing their seeking of mental health services clearly indicates there's still a long way to go toward changing attitudes for people perceived to have mental health issues. So in this context, we emphasize that people with lived experience are a community vital to hear from and deserve to be a primary voice in matters affecting us. The Town Police Service Mental Health and Addiction Strategy that MHAP is overseeing sorry. and is advanced for constraints by its sorry. larger hunt. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but we can hold your time for... Uh, it's really difficult to sort of hear you. I'm not sure. It seems like we have a bad connection. Um, it just seems really difficult to hear. I think it's because I'm in the mode of transportation, so you're probably getting background noise. Right there? <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> All right. Sorry oh, about good. that. We will, okay. con <laughs> we will continue your time now. Thank you. Okay. Let me know. This continues to be difficult. Um, so the Child Free Service Mental Health Addiction Strategy that MHAP is overseeing um, is advanced or constrained by its larger contact in the city and in the service. Um, so at this time, changing leadership, I'm going to address that larger picture in order to inform future decision-making. So addressing the rising level of crisis for people in the city requires that resources be directed sensibly. And much of this, it recognizes in the hands of the province the need for housing, adequate social assistance, and livable minimal wage. But the city and the town police services board need to constantly be on this message home. And this is going to require strong leadership, by example, through tightening the police budget, sending resources where they can, um, prevent and address the causes of crisis. Uh, we're on the right track to address crisis response. Uh, the reason police are called on to address more mental health calls than anyone else is because they're the only service adequately funded to show up in a timely manner 24 7. There has been a partial alternative for many years, uh, receiving a bulk of crisis funding, which has been the mobile crisis intervention teams, uh, combining a police officer and hospital based with the health workers. MCIT can be helpful in connecting people with resources. Uh, but a police officer and hospital worker are also two representatives of coercive systems. This is not what people with experience in crisis have primarily said that they need and want. So the new community, Toronto community crisis pilots are what people have asked for, and they need to be made available to every area of Toronto. And two communication centers that does not have to go through the 911 screening process first. Recognize that this is an ongoing process that we hope will be um, delivered in years to come. The ability to advertise the pilots currently being impeded by their being available only in some parts of the city, it will be very different if they can be trumpeted to everyone in Toronto. There will still be calls that mental health workers will not attend, and police will, so police training and supervision in this area continue to be important. And Toronto Services Board and the city need to turn their minds to additional support needed for follow-up to crisis calls, uh, a, a project that's been very successful elsewhere in the world to rest at centers. Within the service itself, uh, there needs to be an ideological overhaul. The paramilitary approach to policing needs to be abandoned. We often talk about the culture of policing, and I think this is what underlies some of the problematic areas. I assume there was an understanding of this when the term police force to change the police service. We need to differentiate police perspective from a military perspective and not be entirely manifested in the way it could be. The perspectives of police and like the military are that residents of cities are not enemies to be overcome. That recruits continue to be trained in paramilitary drilling. Police, unlike the military, are individually responsible for their actions, which includes holding each other to account. This is likely to be a topic of upcoming inquest about the death of a person in crisis. This pure accountability may be making some inroads in trying to police college training, which is training, I do believe, is better than most police in the province. 
where the perception of members of the public might produce a self shape by the use of force models that's supposed to guide all of police interactions. So this model analyzes the public according to five filters. Cooperatives, passive resistance, active resistance, assaulted, serious bodily harm, and death. You'll note that there's only one positive lens from proceeding people. It creates an obvious bias. There's no, for example, invade specimen lens suggesting a person is not being disrespectful, but this exercises the right to desire to understand what is going on and why. There's no category for person in places. The Internal Police Service Board needs to be clear to the province about the harmfulness of this model, the need for it to be abandoned. So I just want to finish by congratulating the, with the interim and the upcoming new chairs of the Internal Police Services Board and the former chair for its dedication and efforts to the rest of I welcome the new chairs of MTAP and look forward to the Toronto Police Service Mental Health and Addiction Strategy Dancing and the Green Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chambers, for your deputation. Members, any questions, comments? Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Nicole Carrado for her uh, written submission, and I would also like to add a few words um, in regards to this matter. Um, I'll make these comments uh, to consider the important item of the co-chairs of the board, uh, the Anti-Racism Advisory Panel. I keenly am aware of the dedication and passion that all community members of our advisory panel brings to the table. I know that our MHAP members have been extremely committed to hard working regularly attending lengthy meetings that often require preparation beforehand and work in between meeting dates. The issue of how we can improve interactions between police and those experiencing mental health and addiction issues is one of a singular most important challenges we're dealing with today. I firmly believe that because of the collective input of our MHAP community members, we're now doing this better more effectively and more compassionately. And I will continue to this improvement based on the approach taken by MHAP. To all our outgoing members, I want to sincerely thank you for your incredible commitment to this vital work, for your pro uh, progressive and innovative ideas, and for your sincere desire of making it better for all to, uh, Torontonians, including those in crisis and those dealing with mental health and addiction issues. In particular, I want to thank our outgoing co-chairs, Jennifer Chambers and Steve Laurie, for their bold and impressive leadership. Many people have no idea just how, many, how much time, work, and energy goes into co-chairing a panel of this kind, and they have both given of, of, the, uh, of these selfishly. In genuine pursuit of making changes to improve our interaction with people dealing with mental health and addiction issues. They have consistently emphasized the, the great importance of working with and adequately resourcing community agencies who are best equipped to understand the unique needs of this community. And I believe their voices have been heard and are making change and, and will continue to do so in the years ahead. They have reminded us that the voices of those with lived experience just all, uh, must always be um, incorporated in every stage to our approach, as without this, we simply cannot effectively meet the needs of, uh, of our expectations. On behalf of the board, to Jennifer and to Steve, and to all the outgoing MHAP members, thank you deeply and sincerely for your extraordinary contribution to meaningful, improving community safety in the city. I'd now like to turn it over to our board member, Lisa Kostakis, for some additional comments. Lisa. Thank you. So as the author of this report and a member of the selection panel, which recommended the slate of community members to sit on MHAP, I would like to um, make a few remarks. The selection panel was made up of myself, Sandy Murray, the board senior policy and communications advisor, along with Jennifer Simo, a current MHAP member and the coordinator of security services at St. Michael's Hospital, and Andrew Payton, a legal consultant and lawyer licensing candidate. I want to sincerely thank the selection panel, and particularly our community members, who spent many hours reviewing applications, interviewing candidates, and providing their important perspectives. Jennifer and Andrew were extremely dedicated, detailed, articulate, balanced, and thoughtful, and their contributions very much influenced decision-making on the slate of candidates before you. I also want to take the time to also thank Sandy Murray, who was phenomenal at her job, but also um, a wonderful and caring human being as well. 
I would like to note just how impressed we were by the candidates who put their names forward to serve on MHAP. It, it really was a very difficult decision. We were consistently heartened by the genuine commitment that the candidates demonstrated to working with us on the issue of improving police interactions with those who are dealing with mental health and addictions issues. I think a lot of the candidates that we had too, it, it seemed like it was a really a paying job interview. The people were so committed and the skill sets were phenomenal. Additionally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank outgoing membership of MHAP for their dedication, hard work, and sincere interest in this important work since the inception of MHAP. There is no doubt that in part due to their tremendous efforts, we have improved police services for Torontarians who are dealing with mental health and addictions issues, resulting in outcomes that are more effective and more compassionate. In particular, I do want to thank our co-chairs, again, Jennifer Chambers and Steve Lurie, who have led MHAP with incredible commitment and passion over the last four years. Again, also in how involved and engaged they've been for many, many years prior to, these, uh, to the MHAP work. Their leadership, which has been characterized by genuine dedication to improving outcomes for everyone involved and creating more community capacity to deal with these issues rather than having a police response, have been commendable and crucial to the continued work in moving forward with this committee. It is because of them that I feel that we are well positioned to move forward and continue our work on MHAP's vital mandate. And I always go off script as well. Um, and I'm not going to stop today. Um, I have known the names and the people of Steve, Steve and Jennifer for many, many years in my career of 35 years in the nonprofit sector, and they're very highly respected, have contributed in many aspects outside of mental health and addictions issues. So thank you very much on a, on a professional and personal level for that. And I'm, you know, we obviously will always tap into and be engaged with you moving forward as well. We don't really let people go away that, uh, that quickly. Um, I also like to mention, although he's, he's left the room, Staff Superintendent uh, Randy Carter was also very, very supportive and his team uh, with their commitment and their compassion and their contribution to MHAP as well. So thank you very much. Susan Gupta, yes, I was going to do a shout out and I forgot about that, but we do have Susan Gupta who is uh, part of uh, the MHAP as well, always very supportive and is never shy to also go off script. So thank you for all of your contribution as well, Susan, for, and for being here today. Thanks, uh, Member Kostakis. And again, thank you to uh, Mr. Chambers, sorry, Mrs. Chambers and Mr. Laurie. Uh, motion to approve. Ms. Morgan, seconder, Ms. Kostanti. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. We now move to item number five. We have Deputant Mr. Langfeld. I don't, I don't, I don't have it on here. Are you? <coughs> Um, speaking about meetings, do you remember how just before COVID, the last meeting we had, you, you guys had started doing like a tour around the city and we had a meeting at North York Civic Center. And I just wanted to point out, there wasn't always bad blood between Jim Hart and Chris Langenfeld. In fact, uh, at the end of that meeting, Jim Hart came upstairs and he stopped to listen about what Chris and I were talking about. I was in the midst of explaining to Chris about the two maxims of law that say that in law, all definitions are dangerous. And the other one is, in, especially in municipal law, all definitions are dangerous because there's very little that can be overthrown or subverted. And I'll never forget, to his credit, Jim Hart looked at me and he said, you know what, good for you. And I said, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean by that? And he's like, no, just good for you for coming to these meetings and constantly reminding us of that because the greatest lesson that you know uh councillor Crisanti and new councillor chen can learn from me is that jim hart admitted to me three years ago in his office when i was talking with him i said you know most people don't realize that 
you look up a word in a regular dictionary like a Webster's or the Oxford, that same word can have a completely different, wildly different meaning in a legal dictionary. And Jim Hart sat there and he said, yep, I know, I know, I'm aware of that. So I'm saying this because I want to apologize um, to Councillor Nunziata for my outburst earlier while she was talking. Because as she was talking, I had some time to reflect and I was thinking to myself, well, I just assumed she was talking about me. And I thought to myself, well, <laughs> Councillor Nunziata said, you know, deputants do not have the right to call us liars. I mean, I guess people who work for the government. And I thought to myself, well, she did refer to a deputant, which I also spoke to Jim Hart in his office three years ago, that in your bylaws, your corporate bylaws, a deputant is described as someone who makes a deputation. Someone who makes a deputation is described as a person. And then I asked Jim, I said, you know, um, have you ever, have you ever, heard me at these meetings, that case law from the Court of Appeal that says what exactly a person is. And he, he sat there and he rolled his eyes and he was like, oh, only about a hundred times. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's from Cummings and the Ontario Minor Hockey Association, 1979. The Court of Appeal for Ontario said the only legal person known to our law is the corporation, the body corporate. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed, but in the bylaws of this board, you have a definition section. You provide 24 different definitions. You know which definition you don't provide for? Is what a person is. So, um, yeah, I, like, I don't understand what a person is. Like, uh, so maybe if you guys could, uh, and, and while, and I told Jim also, while Andy Pringle was still the chair, um, Diana knows that I wrote to the board asking for, like, w the definition for deputation you guys are using, w what dictionary exactly did you get that out of? Because I can't find it in a legal dictionary. It's a different meaning in, a, uh, in a, the Ox Canadian Oxford Dictionary. And um, Diana got back to me and says, well, the message I've been told to relay to you is that... Uh, the board has invoked solicitor client privilege. Can you believe that? I can't get a definition out of you people because of solicitor client privilege. I don't think that's what solicitor client privilege was created for. And regarding all that Trump stuff on TV, solicitor client privilege was invoked there. And someone, one of those pundits said, one of the reasons that would be done is because of there's some sort of criminality being involved. One thing Jim Hart was going to said he'd look into me for was what exactly, what, what, which dictionary exactly did you guys get that from? And Jim Hart said he'd look into it. Well, apparently that's all he did was look into it because he never got back to me. So, quite frankly, I don't know if you're going to be here next month, Chair Morgan, you know, because your, your term is up. You know, it'd be great so I don't have to come here and say, oh, you guys are lying by omission using these legal words to the public. If you would waive solicitor client privilege and simply get me, what's the dictionary that was used for your definition for deputation? Because the answer is there was none. It was completely fabricated. Thank you very much. Councilor Nunziata, she's such a good sport. She's laughing there. Apology and acknowledgement, so thank you. Well, I will be here next month, that's right. Yes. Thank you. Doobie? Mr. Uh, Lagenfeld? Thank you. Um, so, on this issue of uh, meetings, and uh, there's certainly a lot there of what Derek had to say that I support, but... Um, here, um, I'd like to suggest here on meetings that uh, there should be actually a meeting held in February. And uh, the reason I say that is I'm looking here at uh, history.com, and it has the heading uh, Black History Month 2023 theme. Since 1976, every American president has designated February as Black History Month and endorsed a specific theme. The Black History Month 2023 theme quote, black resistance, 
close quote, explores how, quote, African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression in all forms, especially the racial terrorism of lynching, racial programs, and police killings, close quote, since the nation's earliest days. That's the end of what that uh, Black History, or sorry, History.com under the Black History Month uh, has as its listed theme. And since it refers to black killings, or poli- sorry, kill- police killings of uh, black people, I'd like to suggest that uh, given that this is a police board, maybe we should be having a, a meeting and perhaps even touch on uh, uh, certainly racial issues in general and the uh, board's uh, um, racial uh, subcommittee there uh, and deal with that. Moving on in this uh, issue here of meeting uh, scheduling, looking down at um, times and locations, there's reference here to uh, um, the principal focus remains to hold board meetings in a manner that complies, that best complies with public health guidance. And so my question is exactly what public health guidance does the TPS believe currently applies to these government meetings? Because we all know that there's a whole lot of uh, uh, interaction of people going on elsewhere, uh, and that seems to be fine. And yet, in this case, uh, you seem to feel the need to uh, only hold these meetings at police headquarters and still do uh, searches of people coming into the building. Uh, Also here in these recommendations, uh, it makes reference to a 9 a.m. start, and the reality is that the 9 a.m. start time for these board meetings was introduced uh, when Andy Pringle and, uh, well, when Andy Pringle uh, became chair of the board and John Tory uh, got elected and joined the board. Prior to that, these meetings, uh, public meetings, were always held in the afternoon with the recognition that uh, it is easier for the public to prepare for and then attend a meeting in the afternoon, and uh, your confidential meetings were always held in the mornings, I'd like to suggest that you should return to that. And um, finally, on the issue of uh, future meeting schedules, um, it's an issue that actually should, uh, I would suggest, be part of the uh, many bylaw problems uh, and have a change there, and that has to do with scheduling future meetings, particularly around the times of municipal elections and that that should see the meeting held after a new slate of city council appointees takes effect, not before, as in this case, uh, where the last meeting was, uh, in fact, the day, I believe it was, before the appointment of uh, new council meetings. Uh, It is inappropriate, and it violates the principle that outgoing governments after an election are permitted only to act in a caretaker role. And so it's inappropriate for a board to hold meetings when the same and potentially all of the city council appointees, who are in fact the majority of the board, may in fact not have even been uh, re-elected. They may have been voted out of office, and yet they could be uh, uh, signing multi-million dollar contracts and uh, uh, things of that nature when they're technically not supposed to be doing anything other than a caretaking role. Um, And then with the uh, last little bit of my time here, Um, There's the reality that, contrary to the Vice Chair's opinion, the judges of Ontario's Court of Appeals have explicitly said, in the court cases that have been repeatedly pointed out to you, that the public does have the right to call politicians liars. And there's a simple solution that both the courts and the public all fully understand. If you don't want to be called a liar, stop lying. And I've got to ask also, what's going to happen when Toronto's Speaker of City Council Um, What's going to happen if, for example, Chair Morgan needs to take a potty break? Is the board going to uh, hold a new vote for someone else to act as chair since uh, Councillor Nunziata isn't permitted to under that uh, municipal code? Uh, Or are you going to take a recess? Or how are you going to deal with that? I believe that's the end of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langenfeld. Uh, Members, any questions? I see none. Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Carrado's uh, written submission. Um, again, can I have a motion uh, to approve? Member, Member Morgan, Ms. Kasakis, the seconder. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Item number six. Mr. Langenfeld.
Hello again. Um, so I'll start with the same question here that uh, comes up every time with these uh, similar donations, and that's uh, how much is it going to cost taxpayers every year to look after these horses that uh, these donations are going to be used for, uh, to house them, feed them, pay their vet bills, train them, etc. cetera. Um, that, uh, how much are these donations actually call it costing us? Unlike the dogs, which at least are housed, fed, and cared for by their human partners, I'll bet none of the officers in the mounted unit are taking their equestrian partners back to their downtown condos to bed down for the end of the day. Um, and even the Royal Canadian Mounted Police no longer uses horses operationally, which raises the question, how is it that Toronto Police nonetheless keep telling us that horses are justified? Um, don't get me wrong, I love horses, I enjoy riding, though it's been decades since I've done it, and I've spent, in fact, time at TPS stables down at the X, and I've met all the uh, four-legged officers and some of the two-legged ones uh, at least uh, a few years ago there. And um, But uh, when one looks at the situation um, of their use, when you look at uh, Ottawa, in which uh, there was an SIU investigation regarding the use of poli uh, police horses, Toronto police horses, in fact, um, they're used to charge into the crowds at the G20 in 2010. Uh, their presence even in February at the Queen's Park truck situation, which was evidenced by the trail left down the middle of the road behind them. Uh, the real question is whether we have any place in at all in a modern police force um, for horses. And, uh, you know, particularly when uh, we keep repeatedly pointing out that uh, we're, we're all about uh, de-escalation and communication, which is not exactly the forte of a horse. Uh, ultimately, these $15,000 donations are an offer for taxpayers to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars more looking after these horses to take care of these tools that are no longer that no longer have a place in modern policing. Um, plus, there's the serious issue here of uh, whether it's appropriate for police to accept large anonymous cash donations, or in this case, to withhold that information from the public. Uh, none of you elected officials would be allowed to accept these kind of donations, so why should police be? Um, so again, I ask for the answer that never seems to come. How much are these donations actually going to cost taxpayers in the long run? I cede the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Langefeld. Uh, any questions, members? I see none. Uh, maybe a response from uh, the service. So good morning. Uh, very quickly, in regards to the deputants' uh, questions and statements, um, this year alone, from January 1st, 2022, to September 30th of 2022, uh, the Mounted Unit attended 91 community events. Uh, they participated in 77 events of crowd management, 25 tours of their facility, 58 ceremonial events, uh, 55 searches, that includes persons of interest, that includes per suspects and, in fact, missing persons in areas where we cannot take our police cars, nor can we take, um, no, we can take other vehicles. Um, they participated in uh, 84 patrols of the entertainment district, which we all know is a, a pain point for our service in criminality, uh, three parades, five divisional um, assistance um, with uh, deployments, um, they did 64 training days, that's uh, in-service and search. They did uh, 27 training days for the mounted unit troop. Um, they participated in 327 radio calls and 869 events of directed patrol. So I would argue that, in fact, we do use them well every day. Thank you very much. Motion to approve. Councilor Nunziata. Seconder, Mr. Crisanti, all in favor? Carried. <coughs> Item number seven.
Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, so we're dealing here with $100 million. That's the cost of body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, and conducted energy weapons over five years. $20 million every year for five years. Imagine what $20 million could do to take people out of tents and shelters and put them in support of an accessible housing well, they, while they, where they will not suffer from the many health problems which affect anyone forced to live in the streets, problems which can lead to violence, criminalization, isolation, and marginalization. Does this expenditure of $100 million reduce crime? No. Does it make the public safer? No. Is it a good way to spend public money? No. As the report before you makes clear, body-worn cameras and in-car cameras are mostly there to monitor police activities so that officers do not misrepresent their interactions with members of the public, false arrests, assaults, and so forth. And you must remember that two-thirds of the charges laid by the Toronto Police Service are either withdrawn or rejected by the courts, two-thirds of them. So there's a lot of problems there. And this is an extraordinary expense to try and keep some officers honest. You can't think of any other organization that spends that much money trying to keep employees honest. Conducted energy weapons are said to help with de-escalation so officers can be less violent with members of the public, although this approach is, is still weapon-focused as it resulted in very severe and lethal impacts. The report talks about how much money will be saved because of automatic indexing and transcription but no figures are given, and one can be sure that when the 2023 budget is presented next meeting, these savings will not be reflected. The mention of savings is a throwaway line to justify expenditures. There's no question but that the consolidation of existing contracts, which have already been issued, as recommended in this report, is a good thing. Consolidation is a good thing since without it, expenditures would be some $79 million more. So this is money that you can't get out of spending, even though it's not a good way to spend money. What can one do in this situation? Well, the police budget, service budget for 2023 and future years can and should be reduced by this $20 million a year for this specific matter. And the board should request city council to dedicate those servings, uh, savings to provide permanent housing to the homeless. That's what the board needs to do today as it approves this report. Just to simply spend this money as though it's a good idea, $100 million, in my opinion, is really, really wrong. And our organization would ask you to make the motion that we've suggested of actually saying you're going to give that amount of money every year to city council for the next five years so we can actually devote it to something very useful which is dealing with the homeless thank you thank you mr sewell members any questions i see none um i'd just like to maybe throw it over to mr stairs and mr Alwal if they want to provide some comments to what we heard Sure, while uh, Colin is um, getting seats front, I just wanted to clarify the cost piece. Um, it's over a 10-year period, not over a five-year period, and that translates um, in the first five years to about $8 million, um, on average $8 million a year, and um, in, on the second uh, five years, $10 million a year. Point. Do we have another deputant? Um, so um, I think thinking about this package, all of these pieces um, we already own, we already use. And um, so this is trying to consolidate and shrink the cost um, and also create some cost protection for us in out years um, where we have a, um, a vendor with a lot of market power um, uh, and we have risk of uh, increasing costs over time. Um, the um, the the utility of these tools, I've got to say, is huge. Um, 
I was at uh, town hall where we were talking about race-based data, um, and um, one of the youths um, sort of challenged me, how do I know when the body-worn camera is on? And we explained, okay, it's, there's a red light that, that turns on, and that's when you know. And she said, that's good, um, because I feel much more confident talking to an officer when those cameras are on. That's the kind of response that we're getting from the public. Um, and also from our officers, they feel that um, it's not about um, uh, accountability as much as it is about a record um, of what their interaction with the public was. Um, and these devices are building trust, both inside the, the officer group, um, who are very supportive of uh, body-worn cameras, um, as well as in um, uh, the areas of, um, of the public, particularly in the more troubled um, neighborhoods, um, where body-worn cameras are seen as a record of um, uh, the events. Um, so much so that uh, one of the recommendations coming out of uh, the race-based data analysis um, is heavier reliance on body-worn camera um, and in-car camera and the reviews of those in use of force situations. Um, and we're looking at other ways that we can exploit um, uh, body-worn camera for uh, transparency. So these things are very much um, uh, creating that transparency. But I think we need to think about this whole issue less in terms of the devices and more in terms of the video. The video is really the issue. Um, video is exploding um, in terms of its use in investigations um, and its use um, uh, in terms of recording the events uh, that, we're, uh, that we're undertaking. We're talking about hundreds of terabytes of uh, video from body-worn camera. I think it's 250 terabytes from body-worn camera uh, this year. Um, and we're talking about, about this year, I think it's 400 terabytes. Um, of uh, video that is um, uh, being seized. In other words, we're um, uh, responding to a crime or an investigation. Um, we show up and we start looking for um, uh, uh, instant uh, banking machines that have cameras pointed to the street, um, that people who are uh, running um, their uh, surveillance systems, doorbell cameras, etc., and we are gathering that video. There is a tremendous amount of video, and that video keeps on getting deeper and higher resolution um, every year. So this is where we have a predictability problem around our costs, um, and trying to keep those costs stable as we move forward is the big challenge, um, and that's why this contract um, is so effective. It's true that we aren't putting numbers to the, um, uh, the um, uh, automatic indexing transcription and, um, and the unlimited storage that we're getting in this deal, um, but just to give you a back-of-the-envelope sense, um, we are spending about $2 million incrementally on storage per year around video. But we think that's going to grow in three to four years to 10 to 12 million. Um, so that's about a, um, uh, well, today we would be offsetting about $2 million in costs. Um, but if we were to continue as we do right now, in a couple of years, that would balloon to an offset of about 10 to 12 million. That's how much video we're dealing with, and that's how central video has become to investigations and to prosecutions. The other big uh, thrust of this is our relationship with Crown um, and our ability to uh, package, um, gather package and index um, uh, information and get it to the Crown and the courts in a timely manner. We've drastically increased our performance, and I think that's uh, a great uh, credit to the team. Um, in terms of that, we've gone from 50% compliance to, I think, over 95% uh, percent compliance um, in terms of our on-time um, disclosure. So uh, the, the package of software, technologies, et cetera, has been hugely successful. Um, and it's been positive for our relationships. It's been positive for um, our efficiency. It's been positive for our accountability. And it's affecting outcomes. Um, so um, and we're getting more product, uh, frankly, for less money in this deal. Thank you, Mr. Steers. Just want to go ahead, Ms. Morgan. Uh, Mr. Stairs, um, uh, thank you for those comments. As, uh, you explained um, some of the data around um, e e the expeditious um, um, of, of providing disclosure to the crowns and, and you know your improvement in terms of your percentages. Is there any data being collected, for example? that um, are surrounding risk management. So for example, um, because we have the body-worn cameras, it A, maybe either lessens complaints, or if there are complaints, for example, the SIU can process these um, you know, complaints, um, OIRPD, and um, you know, in the future, the Inspector General. Um, will there be some kind of data collection that shows the actual savings? Um, because if you have to litigate 
these in any forum, the complaint forum in the judicial system, um, they are timely and costly. So I was just wondering if we are actually going to be collecting data to show how this is mitigating those kind of risks. Um, we are uh, collecting that data. Um, what we found is uh, complaints, SIU complaints um, and, um, and investigations are now hitting their time frame um, consistently. Um, we think that they might be able to outperform that given that we are giving them the video basically day one, um, but they still have to write the reports and run through the rest of their process, uh, investigative process. Um, but there is a definite um, uh, improvement in the performance um, and the return to work of officers who are being investigated. Um, uh, or getting to the conclusion of, of that. Um, the, uh, the challenges are now more systemic rather than technological um, uh, around accelerating those processes. Thank you. Go ahead, Member Chang. Thank you. Again, I'm mute. Oh. I wonder if I could make a comment because Whoever said it, it's wrong. This is for five years. Mr. Sewell, you've had your opportunity. But it's not Mrs. for ten years. It's for five Mrs. years. Mr. Sewell, you've had your That's opportunity. That's right in the in the document. And we now have an opportunity for members to respond. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, one question I have is, how long? It's not right that somebody can give you false Mrs. information. Mr. Sewell, and they I'm asking that, that you respect. How, how long do we retain the video for? Is it five years, 10 years? Is it, because this is definitely a ballooning cost. So, uh, so there's different classes of the video which have different retention periods. Mm -hmm. So because uh, a complaint might be lodged against an officer, we want, we've want we set the retention period for body-worn camera um, just uh, with no other um, uh, issues tagged to it to being the period um, with uh, uh, of that complaint where the, the uh, member of the public could make that complaint plus a day. So that's two years. Um, but we would also um, identify if that video, body worn, seized, otherwise, is associated to um, a criminal event or some other event which needs to be retained for longer. Um, so if it were, say, related to a homicide, it might be retained indefinitely. And is Axon a monopoly, it sounds like? There's not many competitors on the market doing this work. I would say it's a very strong market leader. Um, so they have a they have a very strong um, uh, section of, uh, the, of the market in this space. There are other competitors, um, and we're having conversations to try and foster more competition in this space. But Axon has a strong lead in um, in uh, tasers or conductive energy weapons. Um, they have a very strong lead in um, body worn cameras. Um, and um, in Ontario, they're the selected product by the province um, for digital evidence management. Oh, so it's the province that's selecting them. Yes, the, the province has selected them for that, and they've also selected them for um, uh, the OPP on the, um, on the in-car cameras. I, I guess my question is, you know, as technology develops often, the cost decreases over time, right? It used to be very expensive to store a, a terabyte. An average person couldn't do that. Now we can. Is there a possibility we're locking into a long-term contract where five years from now it could be significantly less to store the same amount of data? I, I fully expect that storage costs will continue to go down. Um, and part of this is getting access to those benefits. The, the, you'll note that the contract is for, for five years, um, but after that it's one-year renewables, um, and we can exit at any point after five years exactly for that reason. And I just have one last question. What Mr. 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 Sewell, I'm going to ask that you respect the person. Mr. Lagenfeld, it's Ryan. We know that you haven't made your deputation yet, and you're next. We went out of order a bit, but we will certainly come to you. I have just one last question. What percentage of officers are wearing body cameras, and if they don't turn it on, what is the consequence? So uh, all our officers were fully deployed on body-worn camera right now, um, and we're just extending it to our ETF teams, um, tactical teams. Um, so uh, essentially all uniformed and identifiable officers will be wearing a body-worn camera. If someone's an undercover or if they're plain clothes, they won't be wearing um, uh, the camera. 
um, and um, it is considered um, uh, a breach um, of discipline if they don't turn on the camera. Um, the point which they turn on the camera is as soon as they start any investigative process. So basically, as they're arriving on scene, they're turning on the camera. Um, and so anybody who's interacting with an officer in that kind of situation should expect to see the camera on the officer with the red lights um, recording the event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steers. No other questions? I would now like to ask Mr. Langenfeld to provide his opportunity for uh, his deputation. Mr. Langenfeld? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry, I, I I was repeatedly unmuting myself on the system, but uh, um, sorry to raise that that issue there. But uh, some of these points, uh, Mr. Chair, are are issues that I was going to raise that uh, the uh, members were actually asking about. Uh, so, um, and certainly one of them is the question of retention of data. Uh, but looking first at the report here, in the middle of page two. Uh, it says 90% uh, of the service's body-worn camera rollout is based on Axon technology. Uh, and so that raises the question, uh, is, there, um, is the other 10% different technology? Is it just uncompleted? Or, or what is the 90% uh, the versus the other 10%? Um, looking down at the actual costs here, We've got uh, $98.8 million for uh, 2,350 units of body-worn cameras and tasers for 10 years, um, or five years plus a five-year extension. Um, so that's $98.8 million. Um, and then even if we assume that there's $4.8 million of that is for the 625 in-car cameras, uh, and that would work out to $750 per unit per year for each of those 10 years. That would still leave $94 million for those 2,000-plus cameras and tasers. So over 10 years, that works out to $4,000 per pair of units uh, per year. And then when you go looking at retail prices for these units, um, a body-worn camera, well, the most expensive GoPro unit, which is the best comparable thing, is a th less than $1,000 per year. Um, when you look at uh, Taser Corporation, which is Axon's uh, public-facing uh, corporation, they sell the exact same Model 7 professional series that they advertise as the same one used by police and military, and those retail for $1,599.99 U.S., which is $2,176. Um, so if you take that math, um, even at $4,000, you're, you're pricing at $94 million uh, for those 2,000 units works out at $4,000. So basically, that's enough to buy brand new equipment every single year of this uh, contract, um, which brings into question the value of the contract. And then there's going back to last month, wasn't the whole justification of the $187 million Onyx uh, contract in November about obtaining the specialized expertise in technology, uh, areas like cloud storage, which was required because of the massive amounts of data specifically related to body-worn cameras and in-car cameras, and yet this contract is all about data storage for that, but what you say you needed that Onyx uh, $200 million 10-year uh, contract for. So isn't this the same data for that uh, 100 terabytes of data storage by Axon? And if this $98.8 million contract provides the needed video evidence data storage, then beyond support of computer equipment for the services, roughly 8,000 employees, what's the Onyx contract for? And if it's only for the 8,000 employees over 10 years, that's $2,300 per employee per year 
which seems unreasonable from that Onyx uh, contract. Given the amount of uh, money involved in these multiple IT contracts, I'd like to suggest first the board should be getting a separate report uh, from the IT department that breaks down and summarizes simply all IT costs, uh, expenses including all contracts, all related IT uh, capital accounts, all IT department costs, all in a single summary report. And second, it seems that it would be appropriate for the service to hire one person to provide an in-depth analysis of what alternatives can be found uh, as opposed to the global uh, monopoly from Axon Corporation, considering that this is a $10 million a year contract with Axon. I think we can justify paying one person to see if there aren't some alternatives, uh, including uh, as I mentioned, GoPro, and I believe there may be other taser manufacturers as well. I believe that's the end of my time. Thank you, Mr. Lagenfeld. Members, uh, maybe Ms. Dollawall or Mr. Stairs, you can add some additional uh, comments to what we heard. Sure, I'll just very quickly clarify the 90%. Um, the point of that statement was that, first of all, step one, this is already existing purchases. We already have 2,350 body-worn cameras already procured in the service. The question was, we need an additional 250, and what do we do with that? So the 90% refers to the fact that if we already have 2,350 cameras of a certain maker model, it would be very um, unfeasible and unsustainable to then find a new maker model for the extra 250. So that's what that 90% relates to. I think there's also, again, um, I'll, I'll try and answer the question about uh, um, Onyx contract and what we're storing um, there versus what we're storing with, um, uh, with Axon. Axon is purely digital evidence um, uh, management, um, so interview rooms, um, uh, body-worn cameras, seized evidence, um, in-car camera, um, those are the streams of, of video that we're getting. Um, the Onyx storage is everything else which may also include videos that have been downloaded, are being used for forensic analysis, are being um, uh, held in team files. Um, there is some duplication between those data sets, um, and we're working on making our processes more efficient so that the digital evidence is only stored um, in the Axon cloud, but right now there is some duplication, um, and so we're seeing this video growth in both sides, as well as we're seeing um, a lot more um, uh, digital evidence being captured. Think about a fraud investigation um, and all the, uh, the documentation that comes through a fraud investigation. There's um, an explosion of data across the board um, that we're coping with. Um, some of that video um, explosion is happening on the Onyx side uh, in our own data centers, and we're trying to catch up by having more cloud technology and less on-prem technology. Axon's cloud is already there. Um, and they're able to provide lower tiers of storage that's more cost effective, and that's why moving into this deal makes sense for us. So there's a little bit of overlap between those two, um, but there's a substantial amount of, um, of uh, separation between the types of things that we store on Axon and the types of things that we store on-prem and um, in our own um, uh, data centers. The other point I would say is um, uh, there's a strong focus by the deputant on um, the devices um, and the cost of the devices. There's support, uh, maintenance, um, consumables uh, with respect to these devices, both data and physical consumables. Um, and um, the body-worn cameras that our officers are wearing are in no way comparable to a GoPro. Um, the, uh, the officers' uh, cameras have to continuously record for 12 hours in frigid cold, um, and they have to be able to do that consistently and reliably. So we put um, uh, all of these devices through rigorous testing. We had um, a side-by-side -side RFP, um, and we put them through um, those challenging uh, paces in cold weather, in hot weather, um, and most devices did not measure up. And I can tell you, because I have a GoPro, um, if you take it skiing, you've got maybe half an hour to an hour of, um, of storage on that thing um, before its battery cuts out. So um, this is purpose-built policing technology. Um, it is uh, cutting edge, and that is, in fact, why Axon has the lead that it does in this market. I do expect others will catch up, but for now, um, there is really only one player that's able to provide that 12-hour um, battery life in the kinds of conditions that our officers are exposed to. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Councilor Nuziati, you had a question? Just one uh, clarification. Uh, so the in-camera equipment, uh, we need to order that be, uh, before uh, the end of December. 
um, to utilize the provincial grant um, that uh, ends on March 31st, just so we're clear on that. So that's the reason why it's here and we need to approve this now <coughs> or we'll lose the provincial grant that, that expires. That is one of the elements of urgency. Um, uh, what's happening here is the province is moving um, to electronic uh, val tags um, and changing the val tag program. Part of that is putting in all Ontario uh, squad cars uh, the ability to um, have these cameras and to do automatic license plate recognition and then to check that license plate against the, uh, the ValTag system. So um, in, um, in trying to make that move, the province is funding um, this change um, for many police services, all police services, um, and we are participating in that change as uh, good citizens of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stairs, and thank you, Mr. Hall. Could I have a motion to, oh, Ms. Morgan. Seconder, Mr. Santi. All in favor? Carried. I also want to thank um, Ms. Corrado for also uh, her written submission. We move on now to item, item number eight. Mr. Langenfeld, <coughs> deputation. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so on this uh, test force uh, contract award here, um, looking at the bottom of page two uh, in the last paragraph, it refers to uh, the buyback was included as a requirement. And then that paragraph ends, the savings achieved through this requirement is approximately 5% of the total contract value. Uh, so notwithstanding that the savings achieved through the buyback is approximately 5%, presumably the service has no idea how much more or less the winning bid was than uh, which did support the buyback when compared to the other potential bids which said they, were, they didn't uh, or wouldn't participate in the buyback. So am I correct that the possibility exists that the winning and only qualified bidder was, say, 15% more expensive than the others, and that it might therefore have been 10% cheaper overall to accept the bids that didn't support the 5% savings of the buyback requirement? And if that possibility does exist, would it not have made more sense to consider potential savings from buybacks as a tender comparison stage uh, rather than making it a requirement of bidding? Um, or is that just my misunderstanding something here of how this really worked? And then uh, since I don't have the luxury of waiting for an answer on that, I'll continue on the assumption that I may be correct. Uh, given that the contract seems otherwise reasonable and without issue, and seeing as the only alternative would uh, uh, to approval would seem to be retendering the whole contract, which would create other fairness, unfairness issues, uh, there doesn't seem to be any alternative other than the board to approve this contract award to test force. However, there seems to be an ongoing issue with the practices used in the bidding of more than uh, one of these IT projects recently. So perhaps the city purchasing officer could assign someone to work with the service on a temporary basis in order to improve their procedures going forward. Uh, a recommendation that I make on the unproven assumption that the, these types of issues don't typically occur on the city side. And however, in lieu of that uh, specialized assistance becoming available, as a general recommendation to those involved on the service side in preparation of these tender requests, I, as someone who has at least a little experience on the other side of this process, having worked in preparing vendors' bids for government contracts, I'd just say, in future, don't make wishes and wants requirements in your bids. Rather, make those part of the evaluation criteria. Fully disclose that those factors will make up part of the analysis phase and leave it to the suppliers to offer you the best that they have to offer and allow them to apply their expertise to try and offer you the best solutions which you can choose from. Nothing should be a requirement unless the lack of it would make it impossible for you to achieve your mandatory goals. And uh, I, I hope that that uh, recommendation is somehow helpful to you. I cede the remainder of my time. Thank you, Mr. Langenfeld. Members? Mr. Stairs, would like to provide a response? Uh, yeah, so I take, I take the point. Uh, Doobie, can I get the mic? 
Uh, I take the point that um, uh, that 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 this consideration um, uh, it certainly has the appearance of, of looking like it was um, uh, uh, mandatory. It was not a mandatory requirement um, uh, in the procurement. It was a requirement, um, but not a mandatory requirement. And bidders could have submitted without the buyback. Um, Five percent is sort of marginal. Um, in terms of recouping the, the value of this equipment. This equipment is very specialized. It's, um, it's used to maintain, test, evaluate um, uh, the, uh, the radio systems um, that um, our officers wear um, and um, our tower systems. So this is, this is a very specific um, uh, equipment with a relatively small market of people who can um, uh, provide testing equipment to evaluate it and, um, and uh, keep it keep up the maintenance so what we're what we're trying to do here is recoup some of the uh, existing value on the old um, devices and struggling with um, how to put that into the procurement without making it mandatory which we didn't um, I think what we're, we're reading into this is some of the vendors were turned off by the um, the ask that they provide a way to buy back the equipment. Um, and for that reason, um, they did not take up and they did not submit um, bids. So we wound up with one bidder who su submitted and did have a buyback option in their proposal, which only amounted to 5% of the, um, the contract value. Um, that compared with trying to basically resell that equipment ourselves um, has proven unsuccessful in the past. So we haven't been able to get that value out of the equipment by, um, by selling it ourselves and I think probably 5% is what it's worth um, on, on the market. Um, in terms of um, uh, the future processes, I'll turn it over to my colleague. I, I think the point was taken on, on clarity of language on what's mandatory and what's not. I think the good thing is this is a, um, this is a shorter term contract, so there is an opportunity to, in, in a couple of years, uh, go back and do this again and revisit the requirements. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, motion to receive, to approve, sorry, motion to approve. Mr. Casanti, seconder. Mr. Kostakis, <coughs> all in favor? Carried. Okay, item number 10, uh, we have a deputy, Miguel. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to address this important item on the agenda, DCSC Special Constables. So on last December the 8th, uh, the TCSC board meet to discuss the quarterly update on violence reduction, reduction program update, or they call it BRP. I spoke on this matter because my concerns are related to the deployment of more CCTV cameras at my building and some issues related to safety in Regent Park. I am a member of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association. I, I wear different hats in the community. I'm a tenant director, and I interact with neighborhood communities officers and 51 division staff monthly at our Regent Park Safety Network and other meetings in the community. From the report, CSU patrols help to proactively deter crime and in many cases help build relationships with, with tenants but it's true, they become familiar with the CSU that walks in the buildings and we greet each other every day. They respect me and I respect them back. So we have a good working relationship. From the report again, CSU staffing update. The CSU BRP has not been fully staffed due to personal shortages and attrition. These shortages remain an ongoing operational issue, and at least one BRP collapse, collapses daily. Additional BRP officers have left the organization since our last report. The CSU BRP has implemented a specialized rotation for three community supervisors. Two supervisors have begun this assignment, with one further supervisor to, add it, to be added shortly. On the December meeting of December the 8th, TCSE Director, former City Councilor John Campbell, was quite interesting in finding out what's happening at DEEP with a background check of candidates to become TCSE Special Constables. A confidential document was circulated but was not made public. Councilor Crescenti wondered why they leave the CSU 
after leaving, after staying for a while in the force, was the two major concerns or comments made at the meeting. In a previous meeting, I, I also heard that many former police officers, ex-jail guards, other members of the army, or other uh, police officers, divisions across the country apply to become CSU staff components. So we have a problem with this, the TSE deployment. They have currently 38 CSU staff, and every year, newly and all CSU staff leave TCSC CSU for better paying jobs. Like this service, for instance. They make more money if they, if they get hired. It's true, there is a bill you can watch if you wanna follow up. So here's my recommendation. The problem that we have in the public sector is not recruitment. The problem is the culture of retention. We had to do better. I speaking as a personal experience as a TC uh, as a Toronto Sioux employee who was hired in 2006 when David Miller was the mayor. They didn't care about me. I was just a token. I could have stayed there, but they realized I'm indispensable. So that's the problem that we have in, in our system that we need to improve because we don't have to have this conversation over and over again. So hopefully, Mr. Crisante, who is in person, and Mrs. Chang, the, next, the other TCAC board member, can make these changes to happen in the new year. So I just want to say to everybody, Feliz Navidad and a Happy New Year. Thank you for, uh, for allowing me to speak today. Before I go, I just want to thank uh, the community safe neighbor officers who very n and the CSU staff for um, sharing uh, their condolences with uh, uh, words of condolences for me because I lost my girlfriend uh, to cancer um, three days ago. My beautiful girlfriend died and um, I'm grieving. But anyway, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the calls, the texts, the messages, the emails, uh, and, the, and, and the best wishes for me because my girlfriend Barbara was a tenant rep and a very love, lovely lady. So please remember Councilor Nanciata in the role of order for the month for the month of February seventh to add it to the role of order. Her name. Thank you. And that concludes my deputation. Condolences to you from the board. Members, thank you. Motion to approve. Seconder, Ms. Stakas. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Item number 11. I have a deputation, Derek. So in this report, it says, with the introduction of the Omicron variant in late 2021, there was a significant increase in member illnesses and isolations due to COVID-19 spread, despite the fact that the vast majority of the service was fully vaccinated in line with the service's vaccination mandate. Um, I would ask if anyone actually has heard Dr. Davila explain or give a definition of what exactly a vaccine is. And I got this from off of Canley, it's from 2007, a paper written by Amir Ataran and Kuman Wilson from the McGill Law Journal. They say that the vaccine primes the cells of the person's immune system so that the person is no longer disease susceptible. And um, has anyone ever heard Dr. Davila explain that after SARS, the uh, Dr. Teresa Tam co-authored a 550-page document called the uh, Canada the Canadian the Canada Pandemic Health Influenza Plan for the health sector, and in it at the bottom they provide a definition for what a vaccine is. And keep keep in mind, SARS had a, a fatality rate of 10 percent. Vaccine was defined as a substance that contains antigenic components from an infectious organism. By stimulating an immune response, 
it protects against subsequent infection by that organism. At this point, we've all been led to believe that you can get vaccinated from, for COVID and still get COVID. And everyone's like perfectly okay with that. Like interim chief Raymer, I remember breaking news on CP24, I got COVID and I just about fell out of my chair once it, they mentioned that he's had four shots for it. So these aren't vaccines. If it was, you would not get, still get COVID after being vaccinated against it. This is um, from George Garvey versus the city of New York, where the Supreme Court of the state of New York County of Richmond recently came down with. Being vaccinated does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19. That's pretty straightforward. I think it's kind of embarrassing that uh, for Chief Superior Court Chief Justice um, Jeffrey Morowitz to know that he's got all these justices underneath his control who've done all these COVID cases and not once could one of those justices come up with something as um, simple and to understand and practical as that. So in this report, it also says, secondarily of note with the implementation of the services COVID-19 vaccination mandate, a number of claims related to this mandate, either directly or indirectly were reported. All claims received during this period are being reviewed with respect to their relation to the mandate and adjudicated accordingly. This is from Noé Charche of the Epoch Times Canada. Figures provided by the Canadian Armed Forces to the Epoch Times show that the military has registered 324 adverse reactions to COVID-19 vaccination with 23 deemed serious. The total number of hospitalizations in the forces due to COVID-19 itself is 16. So for every case of COVID that sent one of them to the hospital, 1.5 cases have sent them to the hospital because of getting the COVID so-called vaccine. This is from a TED Talk put on by Tal Zaks, the Chief Medical Officer of Moderna, and the video which is embedded in the link I provide in my written submission is from 2017 where he says, so if you could actually change that, which we call the software of life, your mRNA, if you could introduce a line of code or change a line of code, it turns out that it has profound implications for everything from the flu to cancer. Now, uh, Supreme Court of Canada actually has covered this before. From 2002, Harvard College versus Canada, Commissioner of Patents. It said the modification or mutation of even a single gene can have colossal consequences. It is instructive, for example, to note the description of Tay-Sachs disease mentioned earlier, which results in infantile deaths from the mutation of but a single gene. Let's not forget that once before, I've said this before uh, at this board, that Moderna, to their, to their um, credit, has been transparent enough to say in their own annual reports and have admitted that currently mRNA is considered a gene therapy product by the FDA. So what you all think that you've been injecting yourselves as being a vaccine, Moderna is admitting to themselves out loud for anyone who's willing to do the research and read that it's really a gene therapy product. And uh, earlier at the sport, a few months ago, I read uh, something off of Canley from a, a Dr. Timothy Caulfield who said that gene therapies got shut down a while back in the States because people were dying from it. So, you know, if you're taking the Toronto Police Service to court, you might want to put all this stuff out there about, like, these aren't vaccines, these are gene therapy products, and they're hurting people, if not killing them. Thank you, Derek. Members, questions? I see none. Well, um, I'll move receipt of the report, and I've had five shots. <laughs> I uh, have a seconder, Ann Morgan. All in favor? Carried. We now come to our last item. Uh, before we adjourn, I just wanted to share just one item. Um, there will be a, a special uh, public meeting of the board on January 9th to consider the proposed 2023 budget. Uh, 
proper notice will be provided closer to um, the date. Um, so just wanted to make sure that's noted. And I also just want to, um, again, this is, this is our last meeting of the year. Just wish everyone a safe and prosperous 2023. Uh, I know there's been many challenges, um, but I'm, I'm wishing the best for everyone here and, and all your families. So again, thank you for all the work and support you're doing. And a real, real quick, I just want to say thank you, thank you to the board staff for all of their hard work, continuous hard work that really goes unnoticed. And um, I just want to say thank you very much. So with that, I'd like to have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Mr. Gallicus, seconder, Mr. Crisanti, all in favor? Excellent, carried. Thank you very much, everyone.